Um, so I'm Fajigan, uh, I'm the section head for the Environment and Sustainability section of the Inside Center. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Inside Center. Uh, what do we do? How do you collaborate with us? Uh, why should you collaborate with us? Um, hopefully, yeah. And so uh, today, uh, well, most research fields uh, experience a, a problem of dealing with very complex problems, much more than before. So this can be from smart cities uh, to aging population to climate change. Um, and today, uh, research in almost any discipline is almost impossible without the software. Uh, so this is why we exist and why uh, where the skills, the tools, and the knowledge that we develop at Inside Center come into play. Uh, so we were funded uh, around 10 years ago by SERF. Uh, you will hear more about SERF from uh, Haley later on, uh, and by the Dutch Research Council and WO. Um, in order to facilitate uh, the, and create a bridge between technology, uh, cutting edge technology, and research. And we serve all disciplines um, from life science to social science and humanities, uh, all the way to environmental sustainability. Um, so, our mission is to empower researchers uh, across all disciplines to innovate the research software. And we uh, put this into place by using our two missions. One is to collaboratively uh, design software, software, uh, software, research software, sorry, um, together with researchers. Uh, and the other vision is to build digital expertise in the Dutch uh, scientific community. So the main tool to reach our first ambition is our collaborative project. So we publish open calls uh, where all researchers at Dutch universities can apply to. Um, and this uh, then we have a, a board that uh, a committee story that chooses the best project, uh, and these are driven by research questions. So we collaborate on this uh, research project together with the uh, researchers from all the Dutch universities, uh, and we apply a set of the our digital solutions to the research question, um, and we develop reusable and open software data and knowledge. And across all of that, we promote open science and uh, yeah, open software of this. Um, our second ambition is to build digital, digital capacity in the scientific community. Uh, and by that, we want to disseminate the tools that we create. We want to disseminate the knowledge that we have. So we uh, give uh, training to uh, academic staff, either PhD students, master students, or also researchers. And we publish blog posts about the work that we do. And um, we are part of different communities uh, for, for an open science and so on. And so all the activities that I just mentioned are actually carried by the, uh, what we call research software engineers, or shortly RG. Uh, these are a highly uh, skilled researchers, most have PhDs in different domains, uh, but they also have strong affinity with the technology. So they can, can understand both the uh, scientific questions, but also the technological solutions that we can offer uh, to solve the scientific question. And our expertise can all these areas, but more than that, so artificial intelligence, analytics, data processing, computing, and above all, we have software quality improvement because uh, we believe that's very important in order to produce reusable uh, software and reusable science. So science that you can continue to use after five years uh, after the project has ended. Uh, so I told you a little bit about what the science center is. Um, we have four sections uh, the science center, the life science section, the social science and humanities, Natural Science and Engineering, oh, sorry, and uh, the Environment and Stability, uh, which most of the engineers that they will present here are affiliated with. Uh, and in this section, we cover uh, things from climate uh, research to uh, uh, hydrology, ecology, and everything in between. So the main focal points for the next couple of years will be climate research, because it is what is the demand from the scientific community and also where we can have a great impact. Uh, it's machine learning for geoscience, digital twins, as you all know, uh, we've been uh, developing in Earth digital twins, um, sustainable and green computing, and obviously remote sensing, which is the reason why most of you are here today. So we have been developing expertise in the uh, Earth application, uh, mainly by the people that we present here today, but also in the other engineering section, uh, in order to position ourselves as a hub of excellence for a, a yeah, air preservation uh, data and um, data handling. 
So we have developed this expertise met in metadata organization efficiency mm -hmm. and data analysis. And I think they will mainly be demonstrated today. So they are that simple. Um, so I just want to uh, emphasize again that if you want to collaborate with us in the future, please uh, check our website, register to our newsletter, and uh, maybe do an open, uh, yeah, register for an open call with us. And I will move this towards to you, Haley. Thank you. So I'll tell you a little bit of, about Shirk. Most of you know Shirk probably through usual services, but um, I actually started working at Shirk five months ago in analytic research. Before that, I was a researcher myself and software engineer. And actually, after starting working at Shirk, I discovered Shirk much more than I was, what I knew before. So I hope to share that with you a little bit. Um, so I'm a community manager, uh, since I'm not one back, sitting in the back. Together, uh, we provide a link between the research communities we serve, uh, so that use our services, uh, and uh, so the internal organization, so that we uh, really know what, what the research community needs and um, uh, how they can use our uh, services efficiently, but also how we can innovate towards the needs of the future. Uh, so SURF is a collaborative organization for IT and Dutch education and research. So we have uh, 100 plus members, I think more than 120. Uh, that, those are the universities, um, applied uh, universities, uh, but also academic uh, hospitals and such, and research institutes. Uh, and, and the members actually uh, give us a direction. Uh, they, they, they steer us uh, because we serve our members. Um, so the services we provide are on the, uh, are the infrastructure services that you probably know, like um, uh, Stalius, a supercomputer, or a research cloud, uh, but also data management solutions, um, and the internet at the university of course. Uh, but it's only one part, actually, of the world that uh, fulfills. We are also an association where we uh, share knowledge and uh, uh, develop uh, new innovations, uh, but always together with researchers and our members. Uh, yeah. But Today, uh, we'll focus on the research um, uh, part of SERP, because we also have an education uh, part, but um, you're all here as researchers. Uh, so I want to share with you the, the building blocks uh, for building your research environment. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot of different services. Uh, the most familiar for, for most, I think, is the computing uh, services, like I said, like Snellius uh, or the grid. Um, I'll go into a bit more detail later. Um, but I only have two minutes, so I'll keep it at a <laughs> high level. Um, but it's also important to know because we have so many services and there are so many different needs. We also have custom solutions. Uh, researchers can get in contact with us and we really look at, at your problem uh, and, and provide customized solutions because every problem is different, of course. Uh, and besides compute services, uh, data uh, management and storage uh, solutions are very important dealing with the big data of today. Uh, and uh, personal identity, giving access and uh, uh, authorization, um, um, like with SHARM or Surf Connects. Uh, and of course, uh, the connectivity is a very important uh, service we provide. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll focus on this a bit, a bit more because I think it's important for this community, the compute services. Um, so Snellius is the new supercomputer. Um, uh, that's uh, the most, I think, for the most uh, famous one the, um, at SERP. Uh, but we also have Lisa, and um, that's a, a large-scale uh, cluster. Um, and a very uh, popular uh, solution uh, for researchers is the Research Cloud, because it uh, provides you with a very uh, flexible uh, uh, environment where you can do your computations in, in terms of a virtual machine you can start on the cloud. And on the back end, uh, it, it, it can be different kinds of cloud providers, uh, like HPC Cloud at Zurich, but also uh, the public cloud. And Martin will tell me more about that, I think, later. So um, uh, looking forward to that. Um, but if you have very high uh, um, um, big data sets and you need a lot of high throughput processing, um, actually, you can better uh, uh, make use of our distributed data processing uh, services uh, on the grid uh, and spider. Um, yeah, and like I said, there are uh, custom uh, solutions available uh, with uh, visualizations and uh, uh, data processing. Um, and we have also specific programs uh, with the machine learning and quantum computing to uh, drive uh, innovation in research. 
um, well, because uh, there will be a talk on uh, the cloud, I will not uh, spend too much time on this, uh, but um, uh, it is important to, uh, or interesting to note that uh, you can make use of the public uh, cloud to serve Cumulus, but also the uh, uh, HPC cloud to uh, serve research cloud. Um, Okay, so this is also a very big, uh, fast overview of the different services we provide, but how do you get access to our services? Uh, something that's not always very clear to everybody. Uh, there are different ways, uh, depending on how big the need is, uh, your specific project. If you have a small project and you can uh, apply for a pilot plan that runs for one year and that goes directly to serve, um, you can have a look at the left website, I can uh, share the link later. Um, if you have a, um, well, sometimes people have done a few pilot grants and they uh, realize, well, we need uh, a bit more uh, than that that can offer. That goes to MWO. Uh, you can apply for a regular uh, grant. Uh, well, give some details of what's, uh, what is a pilot, what's regular. Um, but there's also a way, and some universities make use of this uh, through a contract. So the university buys then uh, the contract through the research capacity computing service, and they distribute the uh, core hours themselves to the researchers, which makes a very more easily accessible for the researchers. They can go through the internal organization, uh, not uh, necessarily through SERP. Uh, for example, I used to work at Utrecht University. Uh, we did that, uh, provide the, the research their access to, uh, to SERP systems uh, directly ourselves. And uh, that was a very uh, um, informal and quick way for them to get on the systems. Also, there are uh, regularly open calls for specific uh, projects like uh, support for uh, use of public cloud, um, so it's, uh, it is uh, useful to uh, sign up for newsletters and keep the website, uh, uh, keep an eye on the website where the opportunities are. Um, yeah, and then uh, very quickly, because you're, if you're interested in Earth observation, uh, we, we do a lot of projects together with the Earth observation community. We also have an Earth observation focus group at CERN, because we see that this, this is really a community that uh, is in need of uh, you know, large facilities, uh, big data, and a lot of uh, data processing uh, capacities. Uh, so this is just a selection of, uh, of some of the Earth observation uh, projects uh, that we do. Um, well, very briefly, uh, the ecology is a project together with the University of Amsterdam. Uh, the uh, birds, uh, the movement of birds are tracked uh, to GPS systems, uh, um, and then uh, they uh, investigate all kinds of research questions, but like the link with aerodynamics and with weather. Um, and that's uh, been, been a long going on, ongoing project together with SERP, also uh, building a visualization tool uh, for that. Um, uh, sharing weather data, so uh, KNMI, uh, the Weather Institute, uh, shares data with other weather institutes throughout Europe, and the uh, SERP helps them uh, with uh, fast uh, uh, network connections uh, to be able to share the data quickly. Uh, C-scale, um, Damon is in the room, so uh, yeah, he knows everything about C-scale, but it's uh, so you can ask him uh, during coffee break. It's providing uh, a federated, uh, um, a uniform uh, access to a federated uh, uh, data and uh, processing facilities for uh, Copernicus, so ASAS uh, um, emissions. Um, uh, last but not least, Topomi. Uh, I used to work uh, on Topomi myself for six years, so uh, I can talk about that forever, <laughs> but I won't. Uh, you can ask me during my uh, during coffee break. But Topomi is a satellite uh, a lot of, uh, with a lot of Dutch uh, components. Um, this project actually I came in contact with SURF uh, for the first time when I was working as home. Uh, we, we were looking for uh, infrastructure to process a lot of Topomi data, couldn't do it in house, reached out to SURF. And together with uh, the data distributed uh, data uh, data distributed data processing team, <laughs> we set up the processing pipeline uh, for the scientific uh, data. So the operational part is done by ASA, but we wanted to have uh, yeah control of the scientific uh, processing part. So uh, fine tuning our algorithms, uh, uh, developing new methods, uh, having uh, you know more control to fine tune those parameters. Uh, you cannot do that operationally, but we could do that at SERP, uh, so we used the grid for that, uh, to do that, and it was a very nice uh, experience, and uh, so nice that I ended up working at SERP <laughs> years later. Um, yeah, so that's a quick overview of this project. But we uh, also want to uh, do at SERP uh, build communities, so because 
well, we have infrastructure, but we're also developing new infrastructure. We need to look forward uh, into the future, but we need uh, research communities to guide us. What, what do researchers need in five to 10 years? So we really need to, to have this uh, uh, close uh, link with the communities. So we started a community platform so communities uh, feel uh, free to check it out and to join. We're organizing a seminar 23rd of November at the PTEC uh, on digital twins. It's a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, but how to, uh, as an uh, uh, individual researcher, how do you prepare your infrastructure to deal with all this data that's coming? Um, yeah, so uh, feel free to sign up for that. Uh, and we hold interviews with researchers to uh, uh, see what's going on. If you think you, uh, it's interesting for you, please contact me and we uh, can set something up. Um, here's some links uh, if you want to uh, apply for access or for more information. Okay. Okay. Right. So now we know about the Science Center and so. Um, we'll get back to our thoughts, sorry. Uh, I just briefly wanted to interject and say that um, from now, we're going to be basically talking more about the content of the project. Um, we do have some things to try to get through today, but this is supposed to be an informative session. So if you have a question, please do not hesitate to ask, and we will try to accommodate all of that in the proceedings as we go along. Um, so why are you here? Well, probably for something like this. Uh, if it would start, that would be nice, right? Uh, right, so very, very smoothly as we see. Um, what you're seeing here is basically uh, the type of environment that you would want to have. This is a, a possibility of making a dust cluster come up. You log into a supercomputer. Uh, you can just run your analysis as you know it with the facilities that sort of provide. So you can look at how your processing is going, but nevertheless, you have this Jupyter Notebook API that, that you're accustomed to. So it allows you to prototype interactively on high performance um, infrastructure and really go to that next step in how you can work with your data and how you can, how you can do your analysis. So you're no longer stuck with submitting things if you actually prototype at scale. Um, and this is just running through the video of some things. But the, the, basically, all of this you will see later today, um, but then with more explanation as we, as we uh, work through it. <coughs> okay. So, but why are that? So, we use this picture as kind of the, the teaser for, uh, for getting here. Uh, this is a composite of the material we, from NASA and uh, the USGS that we found on the Splash, uh, but it could be from from ESO or from any basically other remote sensing provider. And what it shows you is that we've reached the stage where we have explicit detailed remote sensing observations or Earth observations. And this is the satellite imagery from uh, Central Web. But also other remote sensing. So this is this is this is weather data coverage from remote sensing stations across the globe. And the resolution of the so the spatial resolution is becoming so high that the data sets, while exquisite for science, are exceedingly difficult to deal with um, from a computational standpoint. So that's the situation now, and it's only set to get um, more ubiquitous in terms of data. So this is a picture of ESA satellite fleet, um, basically focused on Earth observations in some way. So you have the Copernicus suite, you have the, the dedicated ESA science suite, as well as the meteorology suite. And you see from 2010 moving to now and then into the future that there's just simply more and more assets coming online. And they will be delivering data at increasingly high rates. And you need to be prepared to be able to handle this data if you want to use it for your science. And this is just ESA. NASA looks similar. This is just from their Earth Observation Systems um, group of satellites. They have other ones in Earth Observation as well. Uh, the major difference is that NASA makes more flashy pictures than ESA does, so that's why this looks cool. Um, but yeah, and then those are the two big players. I mean, the, the other space agencies are also launching satellites at an ever increasing rate. So we're moving into this era of big geodata. And the key challenge to that is to making it accessible for research and to actually gain benefit from it is to democratize it. You don't want to have just the people at institutes that have 
high computational resource budgets that can actually do science on this. We want everyone with a good idea to be able to do this, especially in a knowledge economy like the Netherlands. So what you have to do with is petabyte scale data sets, high resolution data. Um, and as I said, they propose a unique opportunity for the scientific community. You have rapid repeat, so you can actually follow things in time. You don't have to wait for weeks until you get a repeat observation. It's more on the day to even hours condensed. You have high resolution, so you can actually see things in detail and uh, disentangle processes that may be happening on, on smaller spatial scales. You have contiguous coverage at the same time, so you can play this game across uh, large large spans of the globe. So um, we ran a project with um, totally different remote sensing data, LiDAR data, where it was actually key that you were able to have high resolution data about scanning uh, national to to, uh, to continental scales. This was the, the Ecolider project at the UPA. Um, and you also have multi-messenger data sets now. So you can look at the same piece of land, same piece of zero, with different observational capabilities. And that gives you the opportunity to um, address different aspects of the same problem simultaneously and get more, uh, more data and possibly break any ambiguity that, uh, that you would have in your other in your interpretation. Um, that's all fine. But uh, the problem is that local processing solutions do not scale to do this. Um, so even if you have a workstation that is quite powerful, it'll probably be forced to capitulate before this onslaught of data. And now some institutes might have their own um, compute cluster that could still handle this. A majority won't, and if they are there, there will probably be a, a decent amount of competition for it. So this is where um, you need something that allows you to do this on, on a different type of infrastructure than what you have locally. The fundamental challenge in all of this is, of course, you don't have the required processing power, so you need to scale to different infrastructures, and also what to do in terms of the storage and access to this, to this type of data. So where, where can you handle, place, download, access these petabytes or terabytes, terabytes or petabytes of data. And that means that you need the solutions, and they exist. I mean, people have been doing this for a while. There's, there's the, the high energy particle physics community. They know how to deal with large amounts of data, right? And institutes like SURF also know how to do this. But for you as a researcher to access this and use it, it comes with a decent upfront cost, right? I mean, either you need to foot the bill to buy the infrastructure so that you need to process this kind of thing. Or at the very least, even if you can get your hands on that, you need to invest in the amount of learning that is necessary to be able to use these tools. So there's a gap between the technological abilities and let's say where the research community currently stands in terms of what the, the standard workflow is. And that's, that's the problem that you want to solve to democratize big geo data. Now, as I said, the national infrastructures that are around can actually provide the processing data requirements. I mean, I need to solve this, so can basically do this. They have processing power, they have storage solutions, they can deal with this. But there's this gap. And so what do you need to fill the gap? To fill the gap, you need something middleware. -like. You need a software solution that can bridge the divide between where the researcher is in terms of their custom workflow and where the infrastructure is in terms of the API that it exposes how the people can interact with it. And this is where the Netherlands eScience Center comes in. This is, this is our bread and butter. We basically make research software. This is our mission. And this is why we're doing this project together with SURF to allow the Dutch uh, Earth Observation and Remote Sensing Research Communities to move their workflows to SURF's infrastructure with as little pain as possible. Just have, there will be a little bit of pain involved. I think we do take a little bit of time. Um, this is an initial pilot project. Uh, we had 1.3 FTE for this. Uh, it ran for about a year. Um, the initial focus was to identify common issues in the Earth observation, remote sensing, science analysis chain, and to gauge community requirements. So what we basically did was um, we drew use cases from the scientific community. So uh, we reached out to the people that we were running projects with uh, currently, um, running e-science center projects, or 
key co collaborations that we are involved in already. Um, and then we wanted to identify common requirements on those. So the, the ones we settled on are kind of representative for many projects, and we're very interested to hear more about all of your projects and where you would want to have added capabilities. Is a, a project called, which we call Phonology. It's with Raul uh, Zurita uh, Mila, and Sarkar uh, was also involved, who's in the room um, at the University of Twente. It's aimed on understanding and modeling uh, phonological uh, variability at continental scales. So it's, uh, it basically has lots of remote sensing uh, satellite observation data. We did a project looking at uh, detecting and modeling damage to Antarctic ice shelves with uh, Steph Demit and Mike Isabak, who's also in the audience, um, which, uh, I'll, yeah, which is also basically satellite imagery and, and data processing. And we looked at the ESM Paulson, which is a, a community collaboration project that the Science Center has been involved in for quite some time. Um, and this is focused at processing and analyzing global scale observational and uh, simulation data sets for Earth system models. And it's, uh, it's just repeatedly part of uh, successful uh, the European Union Horizon 2020 programs. Um, so these are, these are the kind of three use cases that we decided to distill requirements out of. And if you do that, then what you see is that uh, common, common to all of them, you have data access. Um, Earth observation data from remote, and you want to often want to store it uh, for for your processing purposes locally. Um, there is a there is movement towards the ability to stream data, but realistically, you're still at a point in time where you also want to be able to have local mirrors of your data in terms of access. Uh, access frequency, uh, throughput rates. So you want to be able to get data, store large data sets locally, but nevertheless access them efficiently for your, for your work. Another thing is that you need to scale your analysis. So the concepts of what you want to do, I think you all very nicely have established. You probably have workflows to do that at, at smaller scales, but you need to scale this up. And that basically means that you need just some more computational power. Um, and that's also a, a common theme across all of this. I mean, you can do damage detection on, on a, an ice shelf, but if you want to do it for all of the Arctic ice shelves, then that just takes more time, more and more processing power, because you don't want to wait for it. Um, and then there's obviously also uh, people that are quite interested in applying machine learning to, uh, to remote sensing data. Machine learning has this issue that it's always a little bit problem specific. So we're still exploring how to maybe make something that is generally useful there. We've dropped it out of this iteration of our stuff for the time being. But uh, if you're interested, please let us know, because this is something that is also hot on our list of, of things to do and interest. But there's also the deployment of things. So if you have a trained machine learning model, and you want to run lots of data through it. How do you best deploy this on the infrastructure that you have? Or if you have a wonderful processing workflow, but the dependencies are very finicky, do you need to install this on the supercompute platform that you want to run it on? Or can you use something like containerization to containerize and separate these complex runtimes from the environments that you need to run them on? Can you simply scale this by using containers? Um, so that's, that's also something that, that kind of pops up, and that's also something that we picked up in, in RS.NET now. And finally, um, as I mentioned a couple of times, you want to be established API. People are accustomed to Python. People are accustomed to using user notebooks. Ideally, you don't want to have them go through the, the work of learning an entirely new access paradigm to do their work. So try to use as much of community-established standards as is already there. So that brings us to the common issues that we've identified in, in our stuff. So you have data, which is the retrieval, storage, and access of data. Um, you want to access big geodata and work with it in a manageable manner. When you have the computation and processing, you want to scale your, uh, your workflows um, on high performance or high throughput computing. So specifically for the use cases that we're looking at, it's more high throughput than high performance. You just want to do a lot of the same thing as fast as you can in parallel. Um, 
And you also have the question of, of legacy workflows at scale. So can you use containers to, uh, to massively scale intricate established legacy workflows on these platforms? Um, and uh, because all of you, or many of you are also developing software and there's a vibrant community of, of software development out there working on Earth observation, you want to be able to connect to community and third party software as easily as possible just to incorporate uh, novel developments into what you're doing um, as you would from your, from your own machine. So uh, capabilities that have been developed. Sorry, forget the question mark. I forgot to remove that. <laughs> Um, these, are, these are the tools that we've actually built in the, in the context of this project, but um, yeah, we'll start with uh, you know, FS. So this basically allows you to have Python talk to sort of Zcash storage system. We have Stack to Zcash, which basically allows uh, the Spatial Temple Asset Catalog, I'll touch on that in a second, to nicely integrate with Zcash and um, <laughs> allows you to use service infrastructure to pull stuff over. Um, and then you have uh, duffers on, uh, on service infrastructure. So moving from, sorry, containers. So moving from Docker, which you may be acquainted with to Singularity, which actually runs on high performance compute systems. And then of course, things like Jupyter and Dask. Dask is a processing engine on, on um, the infrastructure that service provides. But this demonstration is not about us talking about technical solutions. What we actually want to show you is how you can use it. So what does how does that do? What do these tools do when they come together? <clears throat> well this is my simplified rendition of what I see, what this, this looks like. So this orange part here is surf, right? Um, and you have service compute solutions which are Snellius, um, supercompute, spider, high supercomputing, uh, grid as Sandy mentioned. And the surf resource cloud, which I abbreviated at SRC because it wouldn't fit. Um, and then in storage, the, the solution that we've been looking at is Zcash, which is basically a, um, a system that was initially developed by, um, by the energy particle physics community and is aimed at massive distributed storage for huge data sets, but double have federated and, and easy access to, to this data. So this is kind of what surf offers you. Um, and what IRS dot does is it tries to plonk this access layer on top of it. So, um, and it leverages technologies like Jupyter to provide you with your, your notebook environment. It also, you nevertheless can log into the systems and use, use the command line. Um, and it tries to use the, the specifications of the spatial temple asset catalog um, to allow you to define um, usable portable accessible data sets and, and data access structures from data that you might be downloading from uh, online repositories. If these repositories also already implement the, the stack specification, great. If not, well, the tutorial will show you, gives you an idea of how you can gather this data and nevertheless make a stack compliant catalog out of it so that you can then use it for your own purposes in a, in a more efficient way. Uh, it builds off of Dask, which basically allows you to scale your computation out from uh, from your your Jupyter notebook environment, but then runs a cluster of workers on the infrastructure provided by Surf. And then um, we showed some capabilities of how to convert from Docker to Singularity, and then run these Singularity containers from the same notebook environment that that you use for your for your other um, other work. The nice thing is that this then basically also provides you with the interface to get these remote data resources. So using this on top of service infrastructure, you can pull the data from online and put it on service key cache and usage. And what it also has is the integration with community and third party software stacks. So uh, you can integrate with GitHub, you can get all of the Pangeo um, software stack uh, and it's, it's designed to be compatible. I mean, uh, Pangeo is also built off of Dask and the, the type of technology that we see here. And of course, you can just connect with the Python package index and uh, get the software that you need. Right, so the use cases. Um, I think we had three. 
and we do. But there's the this one, the phenology case, case very nicely embodies multiple of these aspects. So um, what we'll do for the for the following, we'll focus on this phenology use case, and I'll take you through how that use case uh, works and demonstrate the capabilities that, that we've built on the basis of this use case. So phenology um, basically wants to calculate and then cluster string index models at continental scale. And what it needs to do to do that is it needs to get um, graded weather data, in this case for the, for the United States, um, because that is, the, that is the input to the model that it needs to calculate when it expects the spring index to be, which in later research you would want to compare with what, what you've actually found in your observations. After you've got the data, you need to calculate the spring indices. Um, and then you'd want to cluster them and do analysis. This one we won't talk about today because it's kind of more of the same what we're showing you here. But these two steps will be running through um, in, in the course of our demos. Um, so first off, we'll focus on the retrieval of the graded weather data. Uh, this is the, the DayMet data set. Um, it has weather and climate data for North America at one kilometer resolution. It's, uh, it's about a terabyte of data. Um, this picture is showing you uh, continental North America, but because it's the United States data set, they also have Puerto Rico and Hawaii. They kind of like to have what, everything. Um, the data set itself um, is, is exposed and hosted by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, there are also other mirrors of the data set, but it is a collection of NetCDF files. There's one per region, per year, per variable. So there's several variables. I think there's a total of seven variables. Um, and you basically have a huge number of NetCDF files because it starts in 1985 and it runs to the present once a year. So what we need to do is to download this from... We need to download this from Oak Ridge um, to serve, and then uh, and then you can continue with the process. Um, and so what we want to do is to for a further process, and we also want to make this, this data that we're that we're gathering more structured so that you can you can use it more easily. So we want to combine the data the data and the metadata. Um, into something that's called the, the spatio-temporal asset catalog. It's a specification. Basically, what it says is that you can create geojson objects. So you're specifying what the metadata is, and you're putting a, a link in it. And these can be gathered together to form collections. Uh, sorry, from catalogs. And if you then add more metadata that describes the catalog as a whole, then you can make collections out of this. And then you can use the, the metadata to, to already filter on the, the data that you want to extract from your entire data set. Uh, and so, yeah, so we'll, we'll be using, we'll be creating a spatial temporal asset catalog. Um, and we'll do that on sort of Zcash storage system. And it will be accessible using the HTTP web dev interface to, to Zcash. Okay. Can we check if we are using the correct mic uh, in the teams on this device? Yeah, yeah. yeah using Jabra. Oh, using Jabra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it too soft? The online audience is conscious. Sorry, we can speak louder. Yeah, maybe, yes. maybe I, I, can, I can try to move this closer to you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All uh, right. On we go. <clears throat> so, um, right. What I'm showing you is basically uh, the terminal of Hanalf's Windows system for Linux. Um, and we are currently log uh, logged into uh, where basically wherever you want to be. But um, what you're seeing here is uh, the, uh, the Jupyter Dashboard Fluorum repository. Um, we've already set this up, what needs to be set up on the um, on Slurf, uh, Surf's infrastructure. 
I'll get to that in a second. But what I wanted to say is, A, it's easy. And B, um, this is also something that we are here to help you, right? I mean, if you get SURF resources, then SURF is available to help you set things up. And if you do a project with ESPI and Center, well, we're there all the time. So this, even if the first step might be a little bit difficult, which I honestly don't think will be, I'll show you later, then that is something that, we can, that can be dealt with. So you can reach this point with fair, with fair ease. And then you simply have this script called run Jupyter adapt on Swarm that allows you to start things up. So, do. Uh, you use Python to run the script, um, and it has command line arguments. So what I'm doing is I'm specifying minus p. So I can also be a little bit verbose about that platform. And I'm specifying, I'm specifying spider. Yes. Okay. Um, right. So, so. Okay. Um, so I'll just I'll just hit enter here. You can also use a minus a option, and it will interactively run you through entering your credentials. Okay. I'm unmuted now. I think. Okay, so basically, I just ran this, and now this has been in contact with uh, the Spider platform, and it is um, spitting up. So it's uh, it's submitting a Jupyter server job to Batch Queue, um, and that will spin up uh, the server. So as you see, it submitted it. It waited for Swarm to come up. Um, Swarm came up. Now it's waiting for the server to spin up. This sometimes takes a while. <coughs> Question for those at the back. Is this okay? You can see. Come on, thing. <laughs> it takes a while. <laughs> and there's the server. So now you can just click on. <laughs> this is what you get for using someone else's platform. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here it comes. Uh, That's the first time that they were. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I have. I. Uh, it was working just before we started. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. This is interesting. I'm We'll run that again because sometimes it doesn't work. Okay. I think it's working. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm just gonna put that down. See. If I'm... Okay. All right. So, so, so much for demos and their their cases. Okay. Uh, so this came up. This is this is uh, Jupyter Lab running on Spire. This is running on a uh, on a, one of Spire's nodes. Now it's not a login node, so it's not about restrictions. So it's actually one of the worker nodes. Um, and yeah, so basically you are now in your accustomed environment. Um, so what you can do, we've already set this up, but there's also the, the Git extension here, so you can click that. You clone a repository. For example, you just can simply enter the, um, 
the URL of your repository and it will clone it into this environment for you. So that gives you access to all of the stuff that you've already built and set up. I already have it, so I don't need to do that. Uh, we'll go to this order, this folder, which um, is for our demo and it has notebooks in it. And then we'll start with one of the notebooks. So we'll do the, the download daemon. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so the, what we're going to do here is indeed what I was talking about earlier. We're going to retrieve all, retrieve the data. We're going to build um, a collection out of it according to the spatial temporal asset catalog specification, and then that will be available for our further processing in the in the subsequent demos. Um, so yeah, what as you see here, we're also importing uh, the the stack to dcash, uh, which is the tool that we built for exactly this purpose. Um, <coughs> Kind of scroll thing. Ah, you scroll the other way around. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah. So um, again, this uh, this is on uh, what what we set up was uh, the the connection. Um, when we get to how you set this up, I'll show that as well. Basically, it all it only means that you create a an identification token with scripts that Storm provides, and you put that in a place where this knows where to find it. And that allows it to connect to Dcash. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, and this builds on the on FSspec, which is the library that allows um, access to to data. It's used by Dask. It's used by a host of other software. So this is basically an extension to the type of software library that you're that the programs you use are accustomed to dealing with. Um, Right, okay, so we know that the data uh, lives at Oak Ridge. Um, we've basically gone there, we found the data, we've explored it, and we've come to the regrettable conclusion that they just offer a straight download. There's not much you can do, they don't have anything nice to give you the data. Um, it all has metadata, but it's just kind of contained in their descriptions, and it's not serving any real purpose except for being able to look at it. We would like for it to be more useful, that means we're going to have to do a little bit of work, um, and we're going to. Uh, wait a second, I need to run this. Um, uh, because otherwise, basically, we you can't reap the benefit of having this type of metadata in the first place. So uh, this is not hugely interesting, but this is basically just moving the metadata into structures that we can build the catalog with. It. So. Title and we have a summary description of it. We, add it. we can add the, the DOI, which is the citation. Um, we're adding the, the regions um, so that the, the metadata knows what what the data that it's describing actually like, covers in terms of, of the, the spatial extent. Um, and then the, the parameters that are in the data. So abbreviation, units, descriptions, uh, what have you, water vapor, minimum temperature, maximum temperature. So the actual data sets describing what is the data that, that, is, that is being served to you. Um, it also has a coordinate reference system, um, which we put into this project for string format so that you can then later also um, use it to map two different reference systems. So you're not stuck on this one, but you can do easy transformations between them. And then, um, because what we're basically building is a bunch of files with metadata and, and a catalog object that tells you where all of these files live, you need to specify the, the file format name, and that's exactly this. So this is um, the daemon for version four daily data for this region, for this parameter, for this year, as an etcdf file. Um, okay, so now we've we've configured the the yeah. metadata. Yes, I'm allowed. Yeah. I just can't see that. I just don't want to. Sorry, I can't really hear, but are you waiting for my question now? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah, yes. So the, the metadata that you show is often uh, is often already part of the of the NetCDF file itself, the NetCDF files. So. Yep. Is there a kind of a way to not to have to copy all that? To not to have to do it manually? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, it, but it, it kind of also depends on on um, 
what level of metadata you have. And uh, so what we decided to do here was just to show you how to do it fully manually if you have to, um, because that is the case for some data sets. And then you can also automatically scrape this from, let's say, a template in a CDF file, and then, uh, then create your, your catalog that way uh, for the time being. There are better solutions possible, but that's where we are with this uh, right now. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. There's another following question by Floris. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was not really a question, but I, uh, last month I processed a few uh, NetCDF files or put them into a stack catalog. And in my experience, you always need like, the, there are just, the, the, there are always tiny differences between the data sets. So in practice, you always need to do this by uh, manually. Like we try to automate it, but it's, yeah, it's quite tricky. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your experience. <laughs> yeah, that hence, hence why we're doing it this way this way here. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's say it's, I think as a community, it's been worth looking into for the, although NetCDF is a pretty great standard. So if, if it's already um, not not automatizable there, then you're kind of in hot water anyway. Um, do we have any further questions or should we continue? Okay. Uh, right, so now we basically set up everything in terms of metadata for the files themselves. Now we're moving to the catalog stage. So basically where you combine these assets, these uh, with the individual files are called into a catalog that kind of groups them together and, and gives you some information about them as a, as a whole. So um, what we're doing here is adding a license. Um, um, we're also adding the, the data provider and, uh, and the citation for the data provider. Um, yeah, and then we basically want to specify where we're going to store this. So um, we've run this before, so I'm going to change this to uh, demo three. So this is actually telling you where it's going to go on, on Dcash. Um, the catalog will be called Dama Daily 4, but this is the path, path to the Dcache. And um, uh, then this is where the, this is the root path to where the data actually lives. And then um, we, can, uh, we can start with it. So uh, finally, we're also going to convert the coordinate reference system um, to a, a, a JSON string um, to allow it to be to be converted um, and used in, in further processing. Um, so we've done that, and now basically what we're what, what this is is uh, defining functions to get these assets um, and put them into a catalog and make a collection of it. So the the nice thing about this tutorial also is that if you want to do something like this, you can simply grab this tutorial and kind of use this as templates for what you want to do, and then you should be able to do it pretty much off the bat. Uh, so we're defining those. Okay, and now we're going to actually make the collection. So we're going to loop over the regions, um, and then we're going to loop over the years, and then we're going to create an asset parameter, and we're going to create an item per year. Um, so basically, you can have like nested catalogs. You'll have a year, and it has the, the different um, the different uh, assets inside of that. So it'll be a file per per parameter that you're using, and all of that then is hierarchically subsumed into this, this catalog of the collection. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And then um, with that said, we did that. Um, and now we can get an overview of this catalog. Um, so what it's basically saying is, okay, you can describe the catalog and as you see, the, there's a collection in it, which is uh, the region North America. And it has uh, an item North America with a year connected to it. Um, Puerto Rico, the region, and um, yeah, Hawaii you also have. But you're not limited to that. I mean, you can also look at it in a, in a nicer fashion with, uh, with this. So you can also actually have this, uh, this rich representation in, in the Jupyter notebook with all of the metadata that you've, that you've made. Question? Um. Yeah, I'm wondering, so are you now trying with this catalog to reflect the structure of the data set as it is stored on the uh, source? Because if you just think of the data itself, you could think as the years as a dimension of the 
data itself. So yes, so, so we're currently reflecting it as it is in the source, mm -hmm. um, simply to kind of, mm, let's say, make that data set stack compliant in its native form. If it's better for your purposes and you want to think about how to reorganize the metadata um, to, to fit your purposes, then you are entirely capable of doing that as well. Um, it just means that you then need to uh, write the logic to move the, the, if you move the, the data paths around. Okay. Also, in this case, I think you have the data available per variable per year. Yeah. So, there are mm -hmm. each individual and file. If you want to combine them, you'll have to open them, combine them, create a new file yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like what we're trying to do here is just take what's available and put it in a form that's easily accessible for us. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. No, then it's clear. Thanks. Okay. And basically, we've, we've defined that now. So now we can actually save this catalog. So um, that's that's quite interesting in, in the sense that what you're saving here is not the data itself yet. What you've built is a structure. Um, you've, you've built a catalog, but the entries in that catalog have the paths of where the original data lives, right? So um, it's here. I want the, the, the yes. uh, All right, yeah, there it is. Uh, right. So I'm I'm logging into um, into Dcash now. Um, so right, we're currently in the, the Dcash directory that we we put stuff in, or more or less. Um, as you can see, here's demo three, and it has this daemon daily v4 data set on it, and um, here are the regions. Uh, but this is currently just just a JSON file, right? So it's it's not um, it's not data in it yet. Um, it's just a structure. So what we want to do next is to use the catalog that has all of the paths in it um, to then retrieve the data. Um, and so once you set this up, you can basically say, okay, well. Um, Let's let's do some work on Hawaii. It's also nice because it's not that huge. Um, so we can now subselect the region simply by going telling our catalog, okay, we want to use the region region Hawaii as it was defined. Okay, so this is going to be the collection Hawaii. And now we can um, download this data set. And you can set it to run, and because you're running on surf and you're running on a on a worker node, you can let this just run and it'll it'll get get your data for you and put it on on Dcash. Uh, so now this is this is running basically, and it's using it's using a uh, four workers in total to to retrieve the data. So this is just uh, four floors on on the node that, that you're running on, um, and it's retrieving the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, and the day length um, with which to then uh, run run the model that we'll be considering in the next step. Um, and just to manage your expectations, this should run roughly a minute. Um, and then you'll you'll have uh, the the data actually available on Surf. So then you've made a copy of the asset from Oak Ridge to Surf Dcash Storage, where you can then access it uh, locally for your further processing. And then wait. Yes. Yes. No, it. Uh, this is. Yeah. So so if the, if there were would be fewer available, then it it would use those, but it can use it maximum four. It's also a little bit to stop um, Oak Ridge from being mad at you for requesting too much of their download bandwidth. Um, right, so as you can see, most of the time was indeed spent just in transfer and then uh, in IO to the system because the, the, actual, the actual logic calls were very short, but we nevertheless took uh, a minute and three seconds to do this. But now the data is there, and we can basically persist this um, entirely by Using the catalog save option, um, and then we should have it at our disposal um, on on Dcash. Now, this took a minute um, <laughs> because the data that we downloaded is roughly uh, two two gigabit, um, but the entire North American data is a lot is a lot larger. It's roughly a terabyte. Um, but using four workers to retrieve that. Uh, 
takes you about seven hours. So it's a, it's, it's a manageable proposition in that sense. And then you, then you have it at your disposal. So we can check it out. Um, so this is, again, where we have it. Now we've got the Y. So now if I click this, and it's now retrieving this. So now you see there's actually net CDF files in here. It used to be just, just be this JSON, and now uh, it's being populated with the actual net CDF files. So now you've gotten the data all from your system. Um, and for the rest of our purposes, we have the actual data, which we'll be using. But as we said, we already previously retrieved that. We don't have to do it again. Um, yeah, that finishes this. May I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Is it possible to pause the downloading and continue in another time? Uh, and how do you make sure that the data is complete? So can you check kind of checksum or something? Like something? Yes, you, you you can you can implement let's say checksum. Um, it, we didn't do it in this demo, uh, but but you could do that. Um, uh, I would have to refer to Francesco for the whether or not the the, the pause and resume works. I think if it if it fails, um, I think it picks up again. Let's say where it left off mm -hmm. and and tries to complete the download. But um, uh, Francesco, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, yeah I, ca I can. Uh, so right, right now, no, there is no uh, mechanism in place to to pause the download. Um, so the update of the catalog and the download of the data is a sort of two separate uh, uh, processes. So first you download the data and then sort of you change the links internally, internal to the catalog, to the uh, uh, to, to the to the files that you have downloaded, and then you persist this metadata on the on the disk. So if something goes wrong in the downloading part, you haven't yet touched. Like the the metadata structure. Um, That's why there is this catalog save it time, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So if something fails uh, in the in the download, yeah, then, then you can uh, restart it uh, as it looks like as it is at the moment. Yeah. Question about the availability of the uh, back cache storage. Yeah, um, yeah, I can ask him myself, maybe. perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Dcash stories, is it available for anyone with an account? And if so, what is the data size limit I can copy there? So it's it's a direct offering from Surf. Uh, so if there's any clear like volume restrictions, then it's from them. But uh, we've, we've used it in the past for projects and you've easily gotten hundreds of terabytes of, of, of storage space. So if you were, uh, Raymond can maybe answer. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, how many? Four hundred. Okay. And of course, you will be placed with the you will be placed on this. And it's meant to be around, let's say, 150 or so. That's why. Okay. Um, so either Raymond can repeat himself, but otherwise it's it's easily at the the hundred terabytes level. And of course, this is a system that, that, that that's generic, so all the disciplines use it. So we have all of the WLCD, high energy physics data there, the astronomy data is there, but also some earth observation data is there. Yeah. So so let's say I think uh, in terms of data of storage volume is, is not an issue. And if you if you have uh, one of these ENFA requests or the, the small grants that Heidi was uh, was referring to. All the NWO proposals, you can get access to this, and together with SURF, you can generally scope your needs. And I think that they can generally accommodate the the volume that you would require for your for your work. Um, and I think that SURF is also considering maybe uh, acting as as a as a mirror for for some of the Earth observation data sets potentially. So maybe that's a development that you want to discuss with them in the future. It, it's basically deleted yourself. I mean, this is this is running off of your allocated partition. So if your project ends and you have not made accommodations for the data to stay there, then it will be removed. 
um, this this is this is not meant as an archiving solution. This is meant as a uh, local storage and access solution for large data sets where, let's say, you don't want to stream all of it off of uh, Oak Ridge every time you want to use it, right? So that, that, that's what the concept of, of this is. But just to add to this, uh, you, you could use this as an archive solution as well because there's tape behind it if you wanted to. Uh, so you could implement that. If there's a seamless solution for that, but it's not the main goal. Just to clarify one thing. In, in the hey, file. Oh. Yes, it's called the, the grid storage, basically. There's a limit. There's, uh, there's 200 terabytes of disk, 300 terabytes of tape. Please don't ask all of it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we we have a small conversation on on storage space and tape versus disk um, allocation. Uh, I, I encourage you, if you have further questions on that, to maybe contact Raymond or, or Heidi in terms of the specifications of what Dcash can, can offer you. Um, right, so that's, uh, that's it for this first demonstration. So we now have the, the data set at our disposal. Um, it is quarter past, it's almost quarter past 11, so uh, I suggest that we briefly break for, I think, 15 minutes, you said, you thought, something like that, 15 minutes. So let's uh, let's be back at, um, yeah, wow, between five minutes, between 25 and, and 30 to the, to the hour, um, and then we'll continue. So thank you for your attention so far. Yes, coffee is. Uh, I don't know if it's
Okay, um, so uh, we'll be starting again, um, and I hope the people online are also still still there. I hope you got your own coffee. Um, maybe it's better than ours. Might well be. Um, yeah, just because we had some questions, we will do our utmost best to make the recording and all of the resources that you see here available to you for your own perusal later on. So there's already a GitHub repository with all of this. We'll share links. We'll send our email with links. We'll post it on the website. Have you? Um, yeah, so with that, we'll continue with the, the next demo, which is the next step in the, um, uh, in the technology use case. And uh, I'll let Sana take it away. All right. Thanks, Merit. Um, right. So first of all, so we've now downloaded from uh, the Open National Laboratory the data sets that we need to calculate now the spring index. So that's what we're going to do now. Uh, before I jump into the actual demo, I just want to kind of give you a brief understanding of what we're going to do. So what is a spring index model? So we want to calculate the day of year where we have. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Right. So basically what we want to know is we want to know in a given year, when are we going to get spring? So when are the flowers going to bloom? When are we going to get leaves? What's going to happen? Now, I'm not going to go into the specific details of how the model comes up and how it's done. There are, there are papers that I'll show you. You can just always uh, follow that and understand that in more in detail. But the idea here is to kind of figure out on, from a model perspective what the day of first leafing is, so the day the first leaves come out, and the day of first blooming is where the first flowers come out. Now, of course, these are each individual to a given plant species. So for each different plant species, you have to use a different way of calculating them. And how do we do that? We use basically the daily temperatures, so the maximum and the minimum temperatures, and the daytime length, which is basically the sunshine hours. And using these data sets, we're going to calculate, I'll, I'll show you in the demo as well, and I'll explain it further there, but using the data that we got from the Oak Ridge National Laboratories and the Damon data set into our stack catalog, we're going to use that data set we're going to do some operations on them, which are pre-processing, such as the filtering in space and in time. And then we're going to use this data set to calculate these spring events for a given year and for three different plant species. Right? And once we have calculated these, we will also be saving them in our Dcache using a, a specific format called ZAR, which I'll go into detail further. So the idea is that we have now a stack catalog of the Daymet data set, which Mayor just showed you. Um, a quick point with respect to that is that the in or maybe I, let me let me go to that when I go on to the demo. But what we have is that we have the stack catalog, which we have now filtered for each region and for the years, and we want to use this data. We have the relevant NetCDF files, which we'll be opening using X-ray and Dask. I'll explain again a little bit more on this when I go on to the demo. And using a Dask cluster that is scalable, we're going to now calculate the spring index on the infrastructure. And the final results, as I said, will be stored in the ZAR format. All right, let's move on to the demo. Um, so before I go into the actual demo of calculations, I just wanted to mention that here we have a lot of different imports that we have, a lot of different packages. I want to draw your attention to the stack to Dcash uh, package, which is what we have developed as a part of multiple collaborative projects, Phenology, iShells, and further improved it in our stack. And what this package does is it provides a link between creating a stack compliant catalog and Dcash. So we have Dcash, which take so we have Dcash, which takes into account FS spec, which is not imported here, but basically it it gives you an access to the Dcash file system. But with stack to Dcash, we can actually create a stack compliant catalog. We can download the data set and then put it on Dcash. Now this is a package that was developed through our stack, and that's what we want to show with the first uh, demo. Now, in the second one, which is the computing spring index, we're going to now do the calculations that I just mentioned. Again, as you can see here, we have the stack to Dcache because we need to read now the stack compliant catalog that we have in Dcache. And we're going to use XRA to store these variables and to calculate on them. And why XRA? Because XRA provides you a direct plugin into Dask, so you can scale it up easily. And then let's see, it also, Dask also provides you some advantages with respect to NumPy. It's easily usable with the existing Python packages. So we're going to be moving on there. So what we want to do is we want to calculate, as I said, the day of first leaf appearance and the day of first bloom. And we want to do this on the data set we have. Now, the data set we have, I did a rough calculation. It's basically 6,000 points by 3,000 points, which is around 21 million points. And we have this data set for every day of the year. So this is a pretty huge data set, which on a local 
computing cluster or even on your machine is going to be quite difficult. And we would like to show how to do that on a scalable way, right? So the model that we are using is uh, from this paper, Schwartz et al. And the work that we are showing here is thanks to our collaborations with, with the, in the technology project. For more information, I would refer you to the paper that we have shown here. You can read about the specific model and what it does. I won't go too much into the details there. And as always, as Mayor had mentioned before, you need to access uh, to access any of these data sets, you need to do the authentication with a macaron, which uh, I think you can find a lot of information about here. But again, it's just about setting the access and the authentication for yourself. So let me now move on to what we are actually going to do. Um, so to calculate the spring index, so that's the day of first leaf and the day of first bloom, we need to do a couple of steps. The first one is we have these retrieved collection in our stack. We need to open the variables. We need to perform some pre-processing operations. For example, we want to, so the data that we have contains also ocean tiles, which don't have any, any leafing or blooming events. So we're going to restrict them to the conterminous US, which is basically just the land surface. We're going to estimate the spring index state on the one kilometer grid on which these input variables are already provided. And finally, we're going to save the output. Now, ideally, when you're doing calculations, you can loop over all the years, you can do a large calculation. So in order to not spend your time just staring at a screen, which is running some operations, we're gonna show you here for a single year for uh, the conterminous North America. So what are our input parameters? So we're gonna be calculating the spring index event for the year 1980. And we are limiting our range because, well, ideally we should have spring before August ends. So we're gonna limit our dates for calculation up to 300 days. And we're also defining a bounding box here, which is expressed in latitudes and longitudes, which restricts our data set to the land uh, of North America so that we're not extending out. We also define, let me run these first, which I shouldn't forget. And we're also setting here the decached path where we had already stored the data set. So that is here in the data dataset we have for North America, all of the data that's already been downloaded and priorly available. Let me also show you for 1980 if I can find it here. Or yes, there it is. So we have these three data sets which are available on Dcache, and it'll be these files that we will be reading through back to Dcache and Dcache FS and putting it in a, into an XRA variable and further operating on them with DAS. So here we have now set our paths to the data as well as the path to our output URL. Yes. Yes, right now this is running on Spider, but uh, I think later Maya will also yeah. show maybe or tell you. We can also run this on Snellius. Because I think they actually call the cache. So I think that on Spider, you also have the data storage. I, yes, I do. We do, but um, so you can, the amount of storage that you can get on Spider is definitely dwarfed by what a large data set is. So, I mean, for, this, for this example, we could use Spider local storage. Yes. But what this is showing you is you can co connect directly to the mass storage service offered by Dcache from Spider using the, the macaroon to authenticate yourself and then retrieve the data from there to the processor as well. Yeah. So, um, basically, the question was that here we are using access to uh, Dcache, but then there's also the local storage in Spider that's available. And why not use that? For which, uh, basically, the answer is that we want to show here how to work with really large data set, which could go beyond the storage that is available on Spider, in which case it's always better to use the larger storage of Dcache. Perfect. Um, so, now what we're going to be using is the model, which is called the spring extended spring index model or the SIX model and which is encoded in the following few functions. I will talk a little bit about these functions so you're aware of what's going on. But the basic idea, and this is how to calculate the spring index, is that you want to calculate for each day the number of growing degree hours, which is basically the hours of sunshine, where the temperature is above a certain limit, which in our case is basically 31 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want to calculate these growing degree hours for each day. And when these accumulate over a period of time and they reach across a certain limit, that's when the first leafing event happens. Of course, this limit and all these values are per plant species dependent. So we're gonna do them for three different plant species here. So we now define some basic parameters. So what is the base temperature that we need, the number of hours in a day, the number of days that we have, 
and the leaf index coefficients. This is basically taken from the paper, from the model. And we have three different plants. So we have lilac, Arnold Red, and Zabili. So it's for these plants that we're going to be showing you how to calculate the first day of first leaf and day of first bloom. So of course, for blooming, we have their own different uh, coefficients, which again, have been left, just lifted from the paper. And again, for the three different plant sets. So let's run that. And now we have a few functions that we have defined. This is again, just taken and, and kind of modified into Python. And we have here first, the calculating of the growing degree hours. Um, I'm not gonna really go into details of the mathematics here. As, as I said, please do refer to the paper for more details. But the idea here is we want to calculate the number of hours in the day where the temperature was higher than the base temperature that we required. And we're basically just adding up the number of these hours. Uh, then we want to calculate on the basis of these growing degree hours, we want to calculate some leaf predictors, so which are basically certain uh, trailing day values. So we basically sum up, for example, in, in DDE2, we want to calculate for the past three days, how many growing degree hours we had, for, the, for day five to day seven, how many degrees uh, growing degree hours we had, which is in DD five to seven, and so on. So there are a couple of these, uh, let's say, predictors that we need to calculate for the model. Again, feel free to refer to the paper. I think you can get a lot more information if you're interested in the specific domain issue. Uh, and following these leaf predictors, we also calculate a couple of bloom predictors, which are needed for calculating the day of first bloom. And once these predictors are done, we would also like to calculate when it actually occurs. So for each plant type, there is, as I said, a different methodology or a different model that's needed. For example, for Arnold Red, the day of first leaf is one day after reaching the sum limit that we've provided. So these are nuances that I don't really want to go to, but I just want to explain here that you can define it for each different plant species and you can calculate them here. Now, one point to note is that all the calculations that we have shown here have been vectorized. So they've all, there is no for loop. There are no looping through the spatial variables. There's no looping through X, Y, or so on, because DAS inherently is capable of handling these splits by providing simply chunks when you call these functions. I'll go into details further, but the vectorization basically gives you the ability to speed up your calculation and to scale it up to as many cores as you need, depending on the data sets. So we have here calculating the first bloom, and finally, uh, a function to just compute the mean of all three plants for both the bloom and for leaf. So now we have defined all the functions that we need to run our calculations. So we're gonna first open up our catalog that we had created so this here, we are not using the catalog that we showed you just now in demo one, because that was for Hawaii, but that's a very, very small computation. So we wanted to show you something slightly larger. So we're going to show you for North America, which is, as I said, around 21 million points, but we're just going to show you for one year, because if you wanted to run it for all the years, that's going to take around I think eight to 10 hours. There is a, we'll show you later how long it actually took. So we now have a connection to our catalog and we are now getting the data set. So we are also here converting. So we have now defined at the beginning a certain latitude and longitude, which defines, okay, we want to restrict our calculation to just this box. But of course, our data set is not given in a latitude longitude format. So we have to convert the, the coordinate reference system, which we are doing here, into the, the same coordinate reference system as our data. And now we have to do the calculation. Now, this is where I think RSTAT's functionality really comes into picture. So we want to now say, all of this that I've done so far is done on a single node with four workers. So there's not any extra node, there's not any extra workers. But now I want to do calculation, and this is going to be a, take a long time if I want to run it just on four clusters. So I would like to scale that up. So if you want to scale up your own workflow, we have here on the left the task functionality. So you, I hope everybody can see that. And once you go here, if you go down, the cluster is available, and you can simply scale up to the number of workers that you want. So in our case, we're going to go with. 15 workers. And the moment you do this, what this does is it submits a request for workers to Spider, Snellius, whichever platform you're on. And that's going to start asking for workers, asking for nodes. And it should ideally, as and when the workers get allotted, you will start seeing them here. And but that was quick. This is the fastest I've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. So we now have 15 workers, and each worker has four cores. So we have in total 60 cores, and we also have a total of 450 gigabytes of memory that's available to us right now. And that's as simple as it is. So now you have all of these. Um, I would like to show you very quickly. 
So what we have here is the bottommost, the second one here, as you see, was the original Jupyter remote sensing notebook that we opened. This is a prior existing that there. And now you can see the number of workers that we have requested. 15 of them are now available here as workers that have been allotted to you. And you can see the same thing here. That was just to show in case you're used to the bad system. So now we have these 15 workers with 60 cores in them. So we can now start reading the data set. Now, before I do that, I would like to Let's first connect the task system here. So we have now these workers from task and from, from spider. We need to, of course, inform our Python and Jupyter notebook and the code that this is available to us. So we're now importing a client, which is simply just a drag and drop, as you saw me do. And we just say that the connection is there. So we now have the task cluster available and present in the notebook. I think it takes a couple of minutes for the dashboard to get connected. So in the meantime, I'll just move on to what we're doing here. So now we can start running the model. We have the workers ready and we have imported them into our code. So we can now open our data set. Now, one thing I would like to mention about Dask is that it is a lazy form of execution. So until and unless... Okay, yes, right. So until and unless you actually need to execute something, for example, you want to persist a variable or you want to write a variable to file, the execution instructions are saved, but they're not actually executed, right? So for example, here I've asked it to open the data set and here I'll ask it to actually get this data set. Now. So just opening the data set doesn't do anything, but extracting this will create the actual uh, instructions and these in instructions will get executed and we will be now getting the files and reading these files into our data set. Um, so it's, it's reading, it will take, I think, a roughly a minute again. Yeah, so we'll wait for that. May I ask a question? Yes. Number of uh, nodes that you had. So is there a limit with the number of nodes? Um, I think it's limited by whatever project you have. I think if, uh, as long as you're, what you would normally ask on, on, on SERP or whatever is limited by SERP is what it is. I don't think there is a limitation that RS that will impose on you. You get a certain amount of four hours for your project. Exactly. You have to ask more code to go. So if, I mean, for example, a pilot project is I think 500,000 hours. So if you finish the hours, then you're done. But otherwise you can ask for, I guess, 5,000, 500,000 codes for one hour. I'm just kidding. Uh, and then maybe make a small one. <laughs> Questions online? Yeah, oh, also, yes. Because I used this uh, password before, and my uh, one experience is uh, after, you know, I asked them for 10 workers, yeah. and when the progress going, it could be reduced to six workers. And uh, sometimes even no workers at all, and I have to rerun and uh, resubmit the, uh, the work again. So that's just, uh, I have no idea why does that happen, actually. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I actually. I don't know exactly what was said, but basically, the, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, oh. uh, but the basic question was that, um, so now we, for, for this specific case, we have now asked for 15 workers that have 60 cores. Uh, is there really a limit on this? And I think the limit here is basically what SERP's infrastructure has, which is of course split across all the projects. So whatever you can get from SERP will be the limit that you can get through this RSR project as well. Okay, yeah. one more question. So how do you set up the environment of the working nodes? Because they need to access the same packages, right? Yeah. So how do you set it up? So this is basically in the in the setup of the um of the cluster which we have not shown you of, of this on, on the infrastructure which we haven't shown here which we get to. Uh, basically you specify um the, the DAS config and there you're specifying a what you do is you install a conda environment. 
um, and the job submission script that actually runs. So when you're basically what this is basically doing behind the scenes is it's submitting task workers to the Slurm job queue manager, which then gets scheduled and they get started up with the Conda environment activated there. So you have you have a central image of the of the software environment that the workers should be exposed to. And that and every worker is started up with that with environment. That. And that's the one that you started at the beginning of of today, right? So you, you started yes the slurm yeah, so, that's so, one that you're um, setting up the environment. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So you can you you basically what what you do would do then is you would on on Spider or the platform you want to run on, you would clone the Jupyter Dashboard Slurm repository, you would install its dependencies, then you would install additional dependencies that you would want for your project. And then you could start this up. Um, it's uh, it's all documented and basically it's done in five minutes. Um, but to not confuse this, I would like to relegate that to a little bit later and just run through the setup steps and we can highlight that. <clears throat> basically, our Jupyter lab was only there for one hour, so it disconnected. So I'm just spinning on the lab. So you you are subject to the to the timeouts that um, that the storm scheduler uh, imposes, and we ask for a short session because then you get a slot quickly. If you will, the long session, then you may have to wait a little bit longer. But when it comes up, then you have it for that amount of time. Um, and what the the workers actually tend to do, and what what uh, may be going wrong with you, although I don't understand why, is that not only uh, the the DAS scheduler that is running will try to submit worker jobs again when they time out, before the timeout to keep a number of workers alive and, and being able to, to process. Um, but the individual worker instances are not that long so that they don't block the queues and can get, get scheduled. In, in the, let's say the, the holes in the scheduling that Slurm has when it has to do with requests for longer time from other users. So you're trying to kind of slip in between and, and use a, a queue system in a semi-interactive manner. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, I'm back to exactly where I stopped just before we went into this discussion, which is extracting the data. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so here what we have is uh, using, oh, I can talk a little bit about this while it does download. So what we have here is that we have opened our data set and here we're asking it to download the files. And what's specific here is that we want to use Dask. So basically, we want to download these files in parallel. <coughs> and when you want to download these files in parallel, you want to specify these chunks. So what this chunks does is that it uses then a chunk that array to read these data sets in parallel. And you have here what the, the three dimensions of our data set, which is time, which is the number of days, uh, x and y, which is basically our latitude and longitude, or x and y uh, spatial points. And we're chunking it on the basis of this. Now, of course, you can. Ideally, the data set itself has a chunk, uh, chunking time of one. Uh, so if you use the inbuilt data set values, you will get a faster or more efficient, let's say, read. But also there are certain overheads when you keep reducing the chunking size. So what we have here is, is an optimal amount that we have found by trial and error method that we're using here. But you feel free to play around with these values for your own data sets. And yay, the data set has now been read. And as you can see, it has a lot more points than I originally thought it had. Um, so that's, I think, 64 million roughly for 365 days. And here you see the coordinates, which is X and Y for the two different latitudes and longitudes. And in time, we have basically for each day of the year. And there are a couple of variables which we have now obtained, which is the day L, which is basically the day length, how long, how long was the day, uh, what is the maximum temperature, and what is the minimum temperature. And as you can see, we have now calculated only for one year or read it only for one year, which is 1980. So let's now plot this just to show you visually what it looks. So here we are trying to basically plot the maximum temperature from our data set for a given time to show you. Um, it's quite a large data set, so you can see it does take a lot of time even for plotting. And there we go. So that is a sample of the daily maximum temperature for conterminous United States and North America. And on X is the X coordinate, and 
and we have a y coordinate of, the, of our specific projection. So now that we have this data set in our X-ray, what we want to do is we want to process it. So we want to take this data set, which is all over this entire area. And even though you see the whites here, these are actually basically NAN values. We don't really want to work with these. So we want to kind of restrict it to only conterminous United States, I believe. So we are going to do some pre-processing. We're going to select and we're going to clip it, the box. And we're also doing some basic conversion. So we're going to convert our temperatures and into Fahrenheit because that's what the model requires. And we're going to convert the day length from seconds to hours. So let's pre-process the data set. Again, as I said, most of this is lazy execution. So that's why it's quite quick because it's not really been executed yet. It's just setting up the instruction so that when you actually need to say, persist the final variable or write the variable to the data set, task will then take all of this, will remember all of this and execute these instructions in parallel. So let's see here. It's also plot, plot now Tmax, which is already there. But so now we, as you can see, we have limited our data set to only conterminous United States. And now we can then calculate, as we defined before, this calculate GDH function, which is to calculate your growing degree hours. This was already defined before. And here we would like to calculate this and then chunk the growing degree hours differently. Now, why do we do that here? It's because when we want to calculate the first the day of first leafing and the day of first bloom, we want to calculate across the time span. So that means that we need to have our time dimension in a given chunk, because if it is across chunk, you have a lot of overhead, you have to communicate between them. So in order to have efficiency, we're going to redefine our chunking such that in time, we go from the beginning date to the end date of our data set all in the same chunk to increase our processing speed. And we, of course, reduce our X and Y because we've increased the time. On that. So here you can see our data set, which is basically 300 in time, 5,000 or 6,000 roughly in, in Y, I believe, and 3,000 in X. Right, let's stop that. I'm not sure what this dashboard is. Prana, maybe if you click on the cluster, on the blue box. On the blue box? Which is called up there. This, if you click on the box, yes. Ah, wonderful. This is what I was waiting for. Um, let's show you. Oh. So this is DAS inbuilt. Like DAS gives you a lot of these, let's say, visual tools to kind of follow what's happening and how the things are being done. Um, so for example, we have here the All right. Well, there's nothing running, so that's why there's nothing in the progress. But as you can see here in this, in the task screen, you can see each line is basically one of your workers or one of your cores, and each of them does a different job. And you can kind of follow here what is happening. Of course, it is complicated to in individually understand what is happening, but it basically tells you what cluster is working on what. When we actually go for the calculations, you'll be able to see better. So let me just get onto that. I ran that again for some reason. So here we have now, um, is it still visible for everybody? Can they still see the, the text? Wonderful. So here we have now the calculated growing degree hours. You can see how it fluctuates depending on the day as a function of time from the beginning of the year where it's at least to the 300 days, which is what we have as a limit. And now using this, we can calculate our predictors for then calculating our first leaf and our first bloom. So in this moment, so here with this, we're calculating our leaf predictors, which are the values we need. For example, the, the trailing last three days of growing degree hours, the five to seven trailing degree hours. And then using that, we can calculate our day of first leaf. And here we are doing the same for the bloom predictors and then calculating our first bloom. And finally, calculating our mean of, of all three plants. Now, as you as you saw, when I when I run this, no task occurs. There is nothing that's being done by task. Again, this is because it's all lazy working. So Everything is there and available, but nothing is run until I do something like this, where I'm saying I want to persist. So I want to set this and I want to have these variables available. So now task is setting that up. Wait for it. And now when I plot this value, because I want to see it, you should now see task 
getting too far. Yes, there we go. So we have now a lot of tasks that you can see, which is basically pretty much everything from opening the data set, reading the values, doing all the arithmetic operations that we have, and calculating the final result that we need, which is what it will be printing out there. So as you can see on top here, you can see the task screen, which is basically running each of the tasks. You can also, for example, while this runs, we can also follow the memory of the workers. So maybe There we go. So we have let me move. So here what we have is it shows us the memory of each of the workers, and you can see uh, how much of the memory is being used. And uh, so if, for example, when so this is a great tool for when you want to actually see how this is doing. And because when, for example, you have a memory shortage, if, for example, you you're asking to use a lot of the data, and your memory is not suited right now to handle this, you will be able to, for example, see it here where it will reach the end of your memory available and it will turn red. And basically at, at that point, task stops because it says one of the workers doesn't have any more memory to actually do what we want to do. And then that gives you an indication that, okay, I need to use more workers or I need to find a better way of allocating my memory. Exactly. So you can, you, so if you want to chunk better, then you also need, I mean, Either you can do more workers or you can jump better. You can do both, depending on availability. Yeah. Exactly. It just means if you want to do that, you probably have to specify that in the in your request that you're sending to users. So that that takes some specifications in the in the setup of, of the the queue calls. Last year, were a couple of four. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. This is another small one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Satan from uh, Florida. Okay, I think I got to Katie. Uh, so, if are the data fighter environment available for the uh, project I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, like this, uh, uh, how this environment is available for this project. Study is available for this project? Uh, C scale. It's different. It's not spider. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Maybe it's not spider. Well, just to recap, basically, uh, spider is available for the C scale project, while Snellius is not available, is what I asked. Okay. Um, so yeah, as you can see here, everything is it's still going on. It's basically calculating for the different points, um, all the, the thing. Uh, in the meantime, I can just my hands on the side. Sorry for the mess. <laughs> um, so as I said, here we are. What we are doing is we are running this for one year for for, for United States. But we could all we have also of course run this to test the what we have for all 42 years. And that's available in a separate notebook that you can always you can access through the repository that we have. And there again, we've used 50 nodes with 60 cores. And for that case, to run it for all the years that is available, which is 1980 up to 22, I believe, or 21, um, that took roughly five hours of calculations. So this is basically a lot of points. That's around uh, 30 years of 30 times 365 in time, and you have of course uh, 4,000 by 3,000 uh, in X and Y. And for that, when you scale it up to 60 cores, it takes roughly five hours. Yes. So do you have any clue about the efficiency of the bottlenecks? So why is it, um, what is it five hours? Um, right. Were you limited to throughput, compute time? Um, so in this case, I mean, we, we firstly limited ourselves to 60 cores. I'm sure we could go further, but then that, because the idea here was not to actually do these calculations, but to kind of set up the demo. So we didn't, expand on this like we didn't try okay how many cores can you go or how better to chunk so we didn't really look into the efficiency side of things uh, but i think we did make this demo uh, the code basically available to our collaborators on synology project i believe if i'm not wrong and i think they are planning to look into it to see if they can use it better or if they can improve on it further yeah. in terms of efficiency and, and yeah um, so this i think roughly takes around 10 minutes so, if there are any questions, now is a great time. Yeah. 
But what I meant was basically that X-ray and Dask are compatible with each other. Basically, you can just, if you have an X-ray variable and you want to use Dask, you don't have to set up anything specific to make X-ray work with Dask. They just, they can just plug into each other, basically. Okay. Just like, yeah, Dask also uses FSPEC and the uh, stack to dcache is also compliant. So Dask works with all of these that we have. Yeah. So, so what, what you have in terms of the observation stack, um, large, uh, there's a lot of these and geo on They've built that around uh, Dask X-ray, um, that, that, that's the X-ray basically as, as the, the data model and the data processing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the Python ecosystem and specifically also these are build their data access on top of the FSPEC library. So the Bcache FS library, which is handling the transfer of data from Bcache to the to task here and, and to X-ray. Um, is also built on top of that. It basically extends FSPEC out to to Bcache, um, and that means that you're you're plugging into this ecosystem all of the tools that that you would find there. So how can you how can you get DAS to work with with X-ray to handle um, out of core uh, processing and and large data sets? They work plug and play with what you have here. Um, that that's what this is trying to. Uh, I also have a question because uh, you mentioned Pangeo. One of the developments that also receives a lot of attention there is uh, this bizarre storage format. And I think you're using it also to store your output. So have you also considered using that, maybe storing the original source data in that format and then using that? Um, yes. Um, it's something you can do. Um, but the Zara is still under fairly heavy development, and um, its compatibility with some of the existing standards is still wanting. So, for example, um, Zara is built to uh, the, the, the other one that's there is TileDB, for example. Mm -hmm. But getting TileDB and Zara to work together mm -hmm. is actually quite challenging, and getting, getting the, the standards in terms of um, metadata quality and rigor that that CDF um, imposes to be maintained by Zar. Uh, okay, if everything goes well, it's fine, but Zar doesn't do any checking of that. It's a lot more flexible than that CDF is as well. So if you want to avoid, if you want to safeguard against this inadvertent data corruption, then for the time being, we're just using the, the it as is. It would also involve, um, because the stack Specification itself is basically just a JSON specification across uh, already existing file assets. Um, so if you want to move to ZAR, then you would basically have a step of loading that CDF data and transporting it to ZAR. Mm -hmm. um, and if you need to, well, we haven't done an investigation of the, the, the access time difference. Um, if you're running into that as a model, like we're looking into, but at the moment um, for this, it's kind of Give or take a couple of seconds extra, even with the large, large executions, just use the files as, as they were. But it's something that, that can be and should be looked into as these ecosystems evolve. I'm not sure how they're agreeing time wise. I think that. Yeah, well, having another question from Manuel online. Uh, Manuel, if you want, you can put it up. Uh, Manuel? Cannot hear you from the group. Uh, hello, I think uh, you're waiting for my question, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question about the uh, the catalog and the construction. So I was wondering uh, when it comes to the number of files and creating this catalog, uh, how does it compare in terms of performance? Uh, with a database. So instead of creating these JSON files, which I understood uh, contain the structure. Um, uh, why not, uh, or, or not why not, but how does it compare with a database, for example, um, yeah, Postgres or PostGIS, because my, the, when when explained to the part of the processing, I imagine that that spatial filter, that box that you're applying is being done by any, every in every file. And so I was wondering, yeah, how it's, if you have any idea of how does it scale up, you know, if, if, uh, in the case of at how it compares to a database. Thank you. 
Um, so the the data is organized hierarchically at some level, right? So if you have if you have the parent catalog, then it has embedded uh, child catalogs that uh, have their own metadata. So the the initial uh, bounding box query would be run on the metadata of the child catalogs before progressing down to the files. And then, yes, you're right. It's it's basically accessing the the GeoJSON header um, information for the files to discern which uh, which elements are part of the data set that it then should start loading. Um, the implementation of that in, in a in a database um, is likely to be a little bit faster, but that would require that you have a database server running that actually allows you to do this. Whereas this is in principle, a static file system based approach where you don't have to have a separate server instance running. Um, that in terms of if you just wanted to store the file paths in a database, uh, hoisting all of your data into a database um, would be kind of prohibitive in terms of the the, the backend storage that the database would then need to uh, maintain accessible and, and active. So that's kind of where, where this trade-off lies. Is that sufficient for your question? Uh, yes, thank you. And I don't know if there is time for another question, but also uh, I maybe, um, yeah, I will ask it anyhow, sorry. Uh, the, um, so uh, you're using X arrays. And and I was wondering, uh, uh, and you're doing well, uh, what uh, geo, we geo people call, um, uh, um, yeah, an algebra uh, algebra operations over that. Um, and um, I was wondering uh, why didn't you use uh, or why didn't you go for other libraries to implement this algorithm like GDAL, which is supposed to be, well, in my understanding, is supposed to be more efficient on the uh, rasters operations. Uh, okay, I, I honestly think that we need to have that discussion maybe in the in the comments. X-ray right. basically is also designed to to do uh, array-based operations, which is effectively raster operations, and there is quite some development work going on. I think together between the X-ray and the GDAL communities, but I'm not aware of all the details, so you may be ahead of us there. So I'd, I'd love to talk to you about that. All right, thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the questions. Uh, in the interest of time, so as you can see, we have now calculated uh, the processes are done. So uh, what we need is calculated, and you can see now that the day of first leaf has already been plotted. The results are out, and similarly for the same for day of first bloom. Um, so here we're on the legend is basically the day on which it happens. And of course, as we go closer to the equator, or closer to the center, we have, of course, more hotter days, and it happens faster than towards the northern part of the US. Uh, we now take this, and we if we want to save the data set. So we're now doing that, and we want to save it. And we have now saved it basically in the same spot as where we now we had our original catalog saved. So we also have now an additional folder. Normally, I would show that to you, but in the interest of time, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you that it's there. And please believe me for that. And with that, this one, this demo is done. And I think I'll hand it over to you. For the third and final demo. Yeah. Something in, in between this yes. uh, to the so presentation. This, this, yes. So this was um, yeah, we basically saved this on as well, right? Yes. Yeah. So we this, this was rechunked to then be per plant and then it's stored in, in uh czar um, archive format. Um, the rest of the phenology use case would then basically take this and run a um, a code clustering algorithm over it to identify clusters in space and time simultaneously to identify that they were where these uh, where under what conditions um blooming and, and spring index uh, occurred together um that's very interesting interesting scientifically but from the standpoint of what is actually being done uh it's the same you're running it with the dask cluster so for so we will now depart from the phenology use case and move on to what we were also talking about earlier, which was uh, deployment and containerization. Yes. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, this is what I was mentioning that you want to do the scalable and parallelizable workflows, um, which may depend on pre-existing containerized code and executables. Um, specific use cases here might include uh, the complex runtimes or the, um, the installation difficulties, but also things like pre-trained machine learning models would, would be relevant. Uh, yeah, we'll show you. We'll show you that you can have a scale it with uh, with Aristotle. Um, and we'll be using the ESM Vault tool as a, as a demonstration. Yeah. Um, and I'll take it yeah. from there. Yeah. Just confirm we have, uh, we have time to go uh, yeah. We have longer. We can, we can just go. Yes. Yeah. Um, this will be a relatively smaller demonstration, so I'll be quick to make sure everyone can have their launching time. Um, yeah, so as Merit has said, so uh, we have demonstrated two uh, notebooks. So basically there you are having a, a software and you want to provide it to the user and uh, you are having a, a quite complex API and the user can use it uh, in the notebook as a command line. So this can be one of the situation you have. But maybe you are also may also have another situation where you have a quite complex runtime. You don't want to expose all the front and end of this, of this runtime, but you would rather like to contact it to a containerized solution, and they, with uh, like a fixed uh, given input to this runtime, so a fixed output can be given. So then, to the user, like the interface is very simple. They only need to prepare their input data to a certain way, and uh, they can have their output uh, as expected. Uh, so then, in this kind of like um, in this kind of like situations, you may also want to file your uh, uh, the, this complex runtime. Parallelly uh, through a, a Snellius or a Spider uh, Spider system. So here we are presenting my example. We are using the uh, ESML two, so as mentioned before, as an example. So it is a um, software actually developed by a neighboring team of the uh, eScience Center. Uh, so the main developer, like Peter and Sarah, they are also presented in the room. Um, so basically, this is a tool which allows you to do the analysis of the climate data um, using different climate models and from different sources. Uh, so this is developed by a community-driven effort, and a lot of like, uh, engineers have put effort in it. So the good thing about it is that uh, uh, it has a containerized solution. So the developer have uh, compact all the workflow to a Docker image. They upload it to a Docker hub. And uh, you can provide your input through a input file called recipe. So basically, this is recipe is mainly a YAML file. You can list all the operations and analysis you want to do uh, via the via the uh, ESML tool. And then you can feed this YAML file to the to the tool, and then you will get your you will get your result. So in this demo, I will try to uh, demonstrate how you can file parallel uh, executions. Uh, with the containerized ENTS model to workflow. I will go to my uh, the same uh, Jupyter Lab environment again. Um, I will shut down the previous uh, uh, containers. Hope it's fine. Uh, Anna won't be mad at me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so now I'm coming back to the to the same uh, directory I'm here and opening the third uh, notebook I, I'm having here. So basically this is a very uh, relatively like more simple tool. So the most things we are uh, running through here are the, uh, are the bash commands, which are used to execute the singularity image. Uh, as you can see, I'm also having this compacted image under the same folder uh, of my notebook. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is I will run a bash command under my Jupyter environment and try to set up the user environment for my uh, Singularity workflow. It takes a little bit of time. Shouldn't be too long. Yes. Um, ah, it says copy aborted. So this means I have a, maybe I have run this before. Uh, and there's already a user uh, setup uh, completed in the in the in this environment. Um, so I'm so and I'm now going to execute my uh, uh, my notebooks. Uh, sorry, my recipes. So I have two recipes prepared here in the same directory of my uh, workshop directory. 
So basically, this recipe is a YAML file. Um, what it's going to do is to, uh, we will try to extract some data from the open source of the climate data and uh, uh, do some simple analysis with this data. We will make a uh, we will make a global temperature map of the January of 2000, and uh, make two uh, make a annual mean temperature um, time series from the 1850 to now. So I have two notebooks here. The only difference between them are the data sets I'm using for uh, for running this uh, for running these two notebooks. Basically, this is an analog of uh, saying if you are having a uh, identical uh, workflow and you want to apply it to different data sets, you can run it like in parallel um, as two different learn jobs. And what, um, what our task uh, interface here is providing you an easy access to scale up your, uh, your cluster uh, on the fly and easily submit these uh, these runtimes as task jobs to uh, to the clusters. Uh, I'm going to delete this one and spin up a new dust cluster, as uh, as uh, Pranav has demonstrated you before. So I'm going to click new here. Then I'm adding a new dust cluster uh, number two. Uh, currently, there's no worker scaled up here, since I'm running two recipes. And I know like these are easy workflows. I don't need much resource here. I'm going to be uh, yeah, uh, budget wise here and uh, just scale up to workers here. And uh, waiting for the worker to spin up. I don't work with the people. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll try it again. Oh, <laughs> well, I will take your advice. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, well, I'm, uh, I'm now sort of like, uh, yes, scored up uh, more costs here. You uh, can I hope it's fine. You can I'm going gonna, gonna to use it for only a short time. So, uh, I, I, hope, uh, I hope we are still good at budget wise. Yeah. I added my cluster to my notebook and spin it up. Yeah. So here, as before, uh, as Pranav showed you, I'm uh, having a new set of like clusters, which I can submit my job to. So here, I'm uh, I am going to submit my uh, recipes to the uh, to the to the server. So uh, my recipes are stored here. So basically, what I need to do is uh, I need to specify the path of my recipe and wrap the, my recipe up to a, a bash command and submit this bash command as learn jobs. Yeah, I would just execute this. And uh, so the, what this block is doing is simply I, I, I'm uh, wrapping up two, uh, two bash commands into a Python list. Um, so in each command, I will run my singularity notebook here. I'm using the absolute path here to avoid the, uh, the, the consequence. So uh, if I submit a new job, uh, the dust the cluster cannot find my, cannot find my uh, singularity file. So then I'm going to use the uh, the task client command and uh, file this uh, 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 bash command as futures here. So my commands are already filed. So as you can see, uh, if I print out these futures, now they are showing as pending, which means uh, the jobs are being uh, calculated on the fly. Um, if I go to my task cluster, I, I, I was just going to try to see one of the uh, task uh, uh, dashboard, so you, you don't see the uh, the fancy uh, working progress flow as front, uh, as uh, Prana was showing before. This is because we are we are now finding a bash project now, so uh, you don't have like immediate feedback from Python on what is going on there. Uh, you only see there's a processing, the number of tasks processing, which is number of two. So hopefully, like one when one task is finished. Uh, you will see some uh, green blocks uh, on the dashboard uh, to indicate like why it's finished. Um, yeah, let's see how, how it's doing now. Yeah. yeah so what the uh, notebook is doing is, uh, is first uh, downloading the data and trying to compute the mean uh, annual temperature and the global temperature. Uh, yeah. 
So now we see there's two blocks means these two tasks are finished. Uh, we can go back to our notebook. Sorry. Yes, go back to our notebook. And now if we print out the futures, they are finished. And if we check the, uh, the directory of the, our downloaded data, we see four data sets over here, which is uh, what we expected. And if we check the uh, output directory of the processing, uh, so we see the we see the processing basically will file the we filed here. And uh, we can also go to the directory uh, the, the the processing uh, output directory and check the uh, check the output we have. Uh, it, this should be it. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, now. Now I realized I uh, I, I run it another processing before, but uh, the pro luckily the processing directories are marked with the uh, processing date, so I'm I can go in here and check my uh, process data. For example, we can check the we can check the one of the time series. It is present. Uh, it is plotted from uh, from one of the yeah one of the global temperature data. So this is an analog to, uh, like say, if you have some more uh, larger, more complex workflow you want to do with your uh, containerized workflow, you can also easily use uh, this interface to submit it as uh, like parallel tasks on the uh, schedule, uh, on, the SRAM, on the SRAM system. That is basically yeah. Yep. So what, what I was using up here, was um, for the similarity image. So what we what we didn't show explicitly here is the conversion of the buffer image to the similarity. Building that image takes roughly 20 minutes. Um, in the resources that we will share with you, there's also a link to the repository that has all of the details on how to do that. It is fairly straightforward in the terms that that the, the similarity environment on uh, on Spider and Snellius um, provide you with the tools to to convert a Docker image to the similarity image, which can then be run. As shown here, um, in some cases it can it can be a little bit finicky, but again that's probably at the beginning of your project, and that's also where you have people on the Scrum side or on our side um, available to help you. Um, great. So those were the three demos that we had on. Okay. Um, right. Um, we're running a little bit late, but so we'll we'll keep this one sweet and short. Um, before I start on this, so how you would set up on Google Desk, I wanted to remind you that the Science Center obviously has a lot of uh, stuff going on, and you can stay on top of that by subscribing to our newsletter or following us on Twitter or regularly checking the the, the website. We try to stay actively visible on social media, um, and for things like this demo or other things that will that are coming up or may be coming up, uh, just kind of stay tuned. Uh, we really do try to engage with the Dutch community as much as possible, and we love your feedback. Um, so yeah, just hit us up on social media, please. Um, okay, back to this media. Um, so, how do you set up this Dask HPC stuff that we've been seeing all morning? Um, and I think the easiest to do is just to check out the uh, user's manual that we have. So let me duplicate this again. Yeah, okay. And here we go. So, okay. Uh, this is now the GitHub repository for Jupyter Dask on Sloan. Um, and uh, it's open to the user's guide. And basically, I can just walk you step by step through these instructions, and there is not more to do than this. So what you do is you log into the surf system from your, from your local machine. Um, and then uh, Spider and Snellius, they, they have Git installed. So you can basically just clone your repository onto, uh, onto the machine. You can then change to uh, that repository. You have everything at your disposal. And what we're doing in the next step is we're downloading uh, Mamba, which is the better, faster version of Ponda, to um, 
then use that to uh, create the environment. So here's the just the command. You run a wget command to get Mamba installer, um, and basically you run that. Um, you have to accept the, the license and license terms, of course. Um, and then you can use Mamba to create the environment you want. So the, the repository comes with, Jupyter Asphalt Serum comes with a environment YAML file, um, which has all of the dependencies needed for it to run listed in it. So you can just run this command and it will install everything that's needed. Um, and it will basically make it in, uh, into this uh, Jupyter Dask environment. And then activate the environment. Yeah. Yes, so um, it's at the moment it's pinned where necessary um, and not pinned otherwise. So it will update to latest in those cases. We've, well, we're planning on trying to monitor, but it's a good point. Maybe we'll just take a pinned one and then also have a, a non-pinned one to let it to let it evolve. But yes. Um, right, so you can then uh, activate your environment and then you can use Mamba and PIP um, to install any further packages that you might need for your own purposes. And this will basically then create the environment that all of your workers will see. So this is where you set up the software stack that you need for your process. Okay, so that's, that's the environment. Um, now you need to be able to talk to Jupyter. That's very nice. You need to configure that. Um, so you just simply run these two commands. You're generating a configuration file for the Jupyter server, and then you're setting a, uh, a server password. I think this is, this is optional. You can forego it, uh, but don't. Um, add a password to your server. Um, that way, when basically when you start up the, the server and then get the port forwarding that, that brings the server to you, you will be asked for the password before the rest of the Jupyter server comes up. That way, it's only you who can use it and not someone who just happened by. Um, then you need to run this command to uh, make the, the config file um, readable only by, by the current user. Um, uh, just exactly follow these instructions and you'll be done. Uh, then you want to configure Dask. Now, um, uh, there is a template Dask configuration in the repository. Uh, this defines the default worker settings for the cluster. Um, and we have, it, it's one basic file. It has options for Snellius and for Spider. You can comment out what you don't want. This can be modified. Actually, it should be modified once you've talked to, let's say, people related to your project from Surfer from us who can help you judge the just you what what you might need. I mean if you're happy to do this yourself then just feel free to go nuts. But this is something where you can get some advice. You then update that file here on this on the on the platform and then you basically move the configuration file from from the local repository where you are now to where Dask will look for it. And with that there then you set up your da your Dask configurations. That will tell Dask what type of clusters, it, uh, what type of workers it needs to spin up for its cluster. Um, then we have the the Dcash uh, configuration. This is what we've also been all on about all morning. You need to be able to access this thing, right? Um, so uh, what what we've been using is this file system specification library, FSSpec, and uh, the Dcash FS extension to that. What DcacheFS basically does is it it um, it also includes a connector, uh, a connection specification file, kind of the configuration file, that where you're providing the credentials that the programs will need to access DcacheFS in your name. So what you're doing there is you're making this macaroon thing with uh, the SERP's guide on how to do this. If you have access to serve as a user, then you can follow these instructions and you can make one of these. It's basically just a bearer token. So it's it's a string and it's a unique string identifier that tells you who it is, what privileges this person has and what they can do and then use that to access the system. And once you've generated this locker room, you, uh, you place that in your configuration file and then you've configured your, your dcache. And then that's basically it. Um, you can log out, log in again, um, but 
then, then, then you don't even need to access the, the remote system yourself anymore. Because uh, if you've also cloned the repository onto your local system, or just gotten this uh, run Jupyter Dask on Slurm uh, file here, then you're, you're good to go. You can just use Python to execute that. Here showing you the, the add platform um, uh, command line option. So the three, you can either have add platform, you know, platform, or you can have um, only once. Uh, add platform will run you through an interactive query where you're asked for what, what you want to call the, the platform, uh, what the host alias is, what your username is, um, and, and which SSH key you're using for passwordless access, where that is located on your local system. Um, and then it will save that data into a configuration file. Um, so that next time you can simply call platform with the platform name you specified and it will just load up your credentials. So you can use the same configuration file for multiple platforms, you just need to name them differently. Um, only once runs you through the same thing as that platform, but it doesn't store anything. So if you just want to do a one-off or you're worried about people seeing your configuration file later or something, then that's what you can use. Um, there are also some, some additional command line uh, options that allows you to specify the, the ports for forwarding, that kind of thing. It's all inline documented um, in the script. So if you want to play around with those things, please check that out, but you don't need to. By default, it, it forwards to local port 8889. And it also brings up the browser automatically on that port. So you're set. And once you've done this, you're done. Then you're exactly at the point where we've been all morning and this is all you need to install it. So yeah, nevertheless, um, if that's not to your fancy or you want to do uh, it easier or there you want to use some of the other advantages that, for example, Research Cloud offers, then we've also done work on getting RS. to work on search Research Cloud, specifically Francesco has done a lot of work on that, um, and together with Martin, and Martin uh, is going to take us uh, through that, and that will be the last presentation of the day before lunch. Oh, no, sorry, before our discussion session, and then lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Almost had you <laughs> I hope this does flow a little. Yeah, I think that's on uh, that You need uh, access to the check your device. You know, basically, you need to be uh, allowed to access your device at the Yabra. Yeah. So, at your own. And, uh, um, your institute yeah. probably works. If you're somewhere okay. else, get yeah, EduVPN uh, from the yeah. yeah. You can get yes. a VPN client. Uh, um, use your your own credentials to authenticate yourself there. Get uh, your your VPN certificate, and then you will be basically you're in the white listed space for Spire and Celsius. If you're not that, this will fail because the the sort of protections will simply not allow your connection to go through at all. And how do you support research groups? Because if it is personal, um, so so the presentation. Um, you you can have a shared shared. Um, project folders, um, so you can have individual members that would then have their own login credentials to uh, work together in a project, but if you really want to do seamless group collaboration, then maybe you want to look up some research cloud. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Martin Kant. I'm a cloud consultant at uh, Surf. Ah, that needs to be closer. 
Um, and I will indeed, uh, I heard Mayat say uh, at the beginning that it was easy to set up on uh, on uh, on uh, uh, Spider. So I thought, hmm, okay, uh, there goes my presentation goal. But as I saw the steps, then I think uh, using Surface Cloud could be a bit bit easier. Um, oh, I have to, yeah. Now this has to focus. Okay, Surf Research Cloud. Um, I will do a very short introduction. Uh, uh, at Surf, we had an, uh, a cloud cluster that was open to, uh, where the cloud management layer was open to everybody. Everybody could do their own work on it easily and not well. Create VMs, create network, create disks, but that had a pretty high learning curve. We also saw that uh, it's uh, harder for people to work together. And there, well, there were other cloud companies coming up. So we have developed a cloud management platform, cloud portal called Surf Research Cloud, where you can work together, select uh, your software, select your data, invite people based on their institute account through another surf service. But yeah, because of launch, I won't go into everything, but it's called Surf Research Access Management. And there you can work together on your pre-configured workspaces and data sets. You can add your own catalog items. I will show it later on. I will do a live demo. And uh, you can start working together. Ah, there it is. So you, uh, the goal is you can e so that you can use our platform to easily create reproducible research environments. And you can do that from a, uh, a researcher's perspective start a research environment or from a research support perspective what uh, eSign Center did here create a catalog item to have researchers start their own environment and well I will get back to this later I will go to the live demo now I hope that's always the case with live demos uh, this is our portal uh, I see a bit a little I think this is readable, isn't it? Yeah, it's doing a bit with the uh, 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 the uh, character size and stuff like that. Okay, this is our live portal. You can go here if you want to have access. Uh, uh, there was a link shared earlier to get access to uh, reckonings that serve, so that's already explained. Uh, if you have a budget, a contract, you can log in here. And then if you press the login button, you will first uh, be asked to what your institute. So for example, uh, Surf is here, uh, UVA is also here, University of Amsterdam. So based on your, um, on your institu institute credentials, you can log in. You can also invite people based on, on other email addresses there is an identity provider in the Netherlands called EduID, where you can always get an account to log in. You can on, only uh, access this service when you're uh, invited into a collaborative organization, to, into a group, which is administered by someone uh, who's a member of a SURF, uh, works as a SURF member. I will log in now with my uh, pilot account. So that's what I use, why I use EduID. If I would log in with my server account, you would see uh, a, a lot more, but a lot of uh, ne unnecessary uh, information. Okay, well, it's checking now, and uh, it knows a bit more about me than only my uh, email address that I I didn't log in at our service, but at EduID, and then I get some information back. Uh, who I am, a username for use in this platform, and uh, I'm a member of a few groups, collaborative organizations. One of those is the Dusk eScience group, which Francesco is also a member of, and I'm a member of. So you have all your information here together. Um, and uh, through a surf contract, you also have a wallet here. So you can use that wallet to create to pay for your resources in the surf environment, and uh, we're almost there. Uh, technically, we can also offer on AWS, but we're in the contracting part. So you can also pay for AWS or Azure credits at Surf, and then use them through this platform. There are already uh, two Dusk uh, workspaces running. 
uh, a workspace for us was normally one VM, but for this project we changed that a bit and a workspace can now also be a, cl a small cluster of VMs. And uh, if you're a researcher and part of a team and you just want to log, uh, you don't want to create your own cluster, you can see what has been started for your group. This one, uh, these ones have both been started for the Collaborative Organization Task Pilot e Science Center. And this one is started by someone else. Well, it's also me, but another account of me. So I can only access it. And this one has been started by this account. So I have a bit more control about the leads and, and stuff like that. But here you can see your uh, running environments. And accessing is just pressing the access button. I will do that later on. I will first show you how to create a new one. So that's actually what Mayat also showed just now, but then in our system. First, you can choose your application. These are uh, configurations that configure an uh, entire environment. So we have the notebook, our studio, and the uh, applications you see here are based on your collaborative organization memberships. So uh, I have been invited to see the Dusk uh, cluster, so I can choose that one. This uh, catalog item is not uh, maintained by SURF, but maintained by the, the creators at the eScience Center. So you can see here that Francesco is the responsible person. Uh, you can add your own custom catalog items to this, uh, to this catalog. After this, you choose the group. This does cost uh, catalog items also open source, but you could add it also. Yeah, it is yeah, you can you can be invited to use it. Yeah, and uh, it can also be put on public. But sharing catalog items between organizations that uh, it is possible, definitely. That's the idea to offer your uh, applications and your tools and maybe your data to other people. Uh, here you can show uh, your the group for which you started, because this is a restricted catalog item. You can choose only one group here. Otherwise, your other groups would be here too. I will skip this data set step. The cloud provider here, you can choose uh, here you can choose your wallet. Based on your wallet, you get access to certain clouds. This wallet gives only access to this cluster. Uh, it also the catalog item only sh shows these uh, sizes. And here you can choose your operating system and the size of your worker node in this case. Uh, so we have a worker one core four gigabyte up to a worker of 16 core 64 gigabyte. I would use small workers now. I will skip this step because it's uh, you can also set up persistent storage and, and IP and private network in a system, but for the dust cluster, that's not relevant at the moment. And here you give the name of your machine expiration date it will be deleted on that date but you can put it far in the future but for now this is good because it will automatically clean up my demos if i forget them but you can also keep it running for years uh here you can put in your dcash token which may it said you can uh, uh put in your conda environment file it also wants to know how many worker nodes uh, uh, i want to use and these are uh terms and conditions and then I say submit. Oh, I have to choose a unique host name. Okay. And then I say submit. <laughs> and now uh, there will be a Dusk cluster built uh, and configured. And uh, user accounts will be created for everybody who's a member of the group. And uh, the use of the Dusk cluster, the running machines, will be deducted from your wallet. All that's automatic. And you could just, yeah, I have started here one. So you can just push the access button. And then you're redirected to Jupyter Lab. I already logged into this one, I see. So I will go to the other one and show the login process. Yeah. You've, give, you've been given a username from our system. And we don't use passwords, but we use uh, authenticators connected. So, and that's it. This is 
So this is a bit easier than going through the steps, but but always has a downside. Uh, the uh, the advantage is yeah, it's a user friendly way to start a small cluster, and you have the platform. You can also do other things. You can also create a dust catalog item with other packages already added, so you can uh, put special flavors in the catalog. Uh, there are fast ways to get access and budget to this uh, system, and Oh, pro configured, pre configured environments. You can also uh, link to other data sets and easy user management, as I showed. The downside is that, yeah, I've shown here the, the, the 16 core, 64 gigabytes maximum worker size. It can be a bit larger, but we're not a big uh, infrastructure. We're not Spider or the supercomputer. We are a bit more limited in our cloud offerings. We do have GPU nodes, but they're very popular, and we don't have a scheduling system, so that also uh, 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 can take a while. And uh, also an important thing, at the start of the cluster, you have to select the number of worker nodes you want for the whole run of your cluster. You can't automatically scale up and down during the run. Um, so yeah, those are the, are the downsides, but on the upside, uh, in about 15 minutes, there will be a, there will be a cluster running here. And an idea we are looking into for other uh, projects is that we make a sort of hybrid solution, but that's really difficult. But we want to look into it for this. That the front end is, would be running here, so the Jupyter wouldn't be running in a job, but in the Slurm job, but here on the cloud, and then push the uh, the jobs to the to the job cluster where they belong to the slurm clusters uh, so combined solution but then you have problems with shared data shared uh, accounting and stuff like that but i think francisco wants uh, wants to pick up that challenge if we get an extension on that is that yeah yeah that's it what Thank i wanted you. to share actually uh, wraps up the demos for today. Um, but we we would like to uh, field any questions you might have still, even though we have some questions uh, in the meantime. And as I said, this is the pilot, and we have covered some functionality, which we believe is representative of many of the needs that are out there in the population remote sensing community. You have in terms of requirements or a wish list. So, yeah, um, we'd also love to get uh, back an input from you on this. We have some time left. Uh, it's, a, it's a fair bit to mess outside and see what, what, and we're, we ran a little bit over. Apologies for that. We kind of got carried away. Uh, we will bring sandwiches into the back. Um, so, you can just kind of you know, grab the sandwich, um, and in the meantime, we'll just try to have the, the floor open for discussion, field any questions that, that are there. Um, and with that, I'd like to, to open the, the final part of the demonstration for today. Good luck. Yeah, um,
Uh, yeah, prob probably. We, we haven't tried it yet. So, I mean, I think um, stack, stack itself is, is only the specification, right? So, That's what um, I mean in decaching. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so um, I think the singularity containers mount the, the, the host file system yeah, you're directly. directly. Yeah. So, um, if the code that you're running in the container can use stack to decode or, or is it? It's capable of handling that, then you should be able to, to make use of that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I've seen a lot of packages. Do you want to change for R or Can I do the same thing in R or Um, The short answer is in principle, yes, but work with a bias. Um, and that is that we have not implemented any of those two times. I don't. In principle, bringing this bringing this up is is not a, a huge issue. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know what uh, what the equivalent library for the R ecosystem would be in terms of what facilitates uh, file opening and, and handling. So, DcacheFS, which which um, regulates all of the interaction between the Dcache system and and the the code that you have. Um, is the is Python's go-to library for that? So you would need to uh, do something similar for for the R. Um, it's it's not usually difficult to do that. It's just we haven't done it. Um, and I think the same thing goes. For that I, I I would assume so. To be honest, I mean the the, the way the way that we've extended FSpec is simply to kind of add the add the the web dev interface to. And, and define how FSpec should deal with the web dev interface. So you can do the same thing for, for R um, and the same thing for Julia. It just means that you have to pick up those ecosystems. And because um, because of the, the work in the, the Pangeo community and, and DAF, uh, we decided to do this in a basically in Python flavor. Um, if there's a, a strong desire from the community at large to do it in other languages, then yeah, we'll make a note of that, and we can try to uh, apply for follow-on funding to pick those kind of things up. So, who would like to have it not in Python? <laughs> 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 um, okay, not as well, right? No, but uh, no, sure. I, I I know there are lots of people that that use other languages as well. I mean, Daniel had to leave now, but uh, I know that lots of would say the remote sensing lighter people. There's lots of, of R users there, so yeah, it's, it's definitely worth it. You can also add the R kernel to Jupyter. Yes, yeah. No, Shortcuts. <laughs> no, I, I definitely, but it, it still wouldn't solve the problem of having to do the, the, the connection for, for yeah. Jupyter and, and yeah. that. But yeah, as I showed at the beginning, I mean, it was roughly two, two major tooling packages in terms of the connectivity. And then this is, well, bringing this stuff up is just, Bash and Jupiter, so that that's uh, it's not something that is is prohibited. Sorry, from the research now to Australia. Uh, what about the software that are available on the internet? Do you think that software between um, Cisco and between those software? Um, yeah, it could be. We are looking to be containerized and that's easy. PESI that uh, that has free uh, that has a software stack available through uh, uh, that you can mount on your system, and we're looking uh, at that uh, both in the in the uh, Snellius group and in the Research Cloud group. So that might be a way to to have that uh, software available. Are you uh, thinking about specific software? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I thought that would be a <laughs> <laughs> Um Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> but uh, if you want to uh, work in the model of environment and not only use it for uh, compilation, there are uh, there is an activity from the University of Utrecht that uh, they have created a model of catalog item. We can install it, of course, but they also had a solution for the license. I, I'm not sure how they did it, uh, but it really depends on the license. And you can even log in with more than two people. A lot. So this, we have solved some of the licensing steps, but if you want to use on ports, IP ranges, and stuff like that, so that differs per instance, what can be done. I think that uh, it's possible to create a catalog. Someone wants to add this catalog to self research, but then you need a connection in the license on the same. Yeah, but which licenses on cloud are challenging. But we, yeah. <coughs> what we actually want is that the system picks up your uh, surf uh, market, your surf spot licenses, see which institute you're of, and could pick that up. But that's years away, I, I fear. Yeah. Moment. Just yeah, but, um, we have one for the online question. I'd like to pick that one up, and after that, I'd like to really invite you to just grab something. Take it. And then, then I want to know what you guys need, right? <laughs> okay. So can uh, hang on a second, Sir? Can we can go to yeah. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. That's actually the last question. What is the what what should you to have best account with the different tools, and are these tools potentially also available for students? Or right. Okay. So, so to have a test account to play around with. Well, if you already have a, a surf account for some other project, then you can play with all of this. If you don't, but you have a project that you would like to do something with, then you can write um, uh, an, an e infra request. Uh, so the one with small grants. The the and it has to be project related, but then generally it, it's fairly easy to get limited amount of resources. Or as uh, Heidi said, you can go to uh, your institutional provider. If your institution has a contract to get uh, to get hours, and then or to get access, and then you can play with with all of this as well. So those are, I think, the, the three main three main routes um, that you can get uh, access to try this out. And we've done this all for surf now, but you can basically not not the surf research cloud stuff, but all the other stuff. You can just put on a different uh, supercomputing system as well. If, that tickles your fancy. Uh, okay, it doesn't have to be cache connected, so you have to think about what to what to do in terms of uh, of getting access to your data. Yeah, but it's a learning system, so it's accessible to anyone. Okay, right. As long as you of course have the grant. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you're a student or a PhD student, you can get access, but it has to go through your supervisor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, apart from that, the talk, go talk to your supervisor or sir um, about the the possibilities that there are to actually use them. So, and uh, about the uh, research uh, cloud, uh, in theory, our system is cloud agnostic. So uh, it should uh, the, the configuration files should work for uh, AWS and Azure, for example. But we don't have the Terraform for the cluster yet. Uh, so we have to do some work on that. Yeah. But, um, you thought there was a second question from the No, that no, was it? OK. Sarkhan, uh, you had a? Not exactly a question, but my understanding, Abraham talked about various 
say what we need, but I can expect it to you, you get some ideas. So, what's, yeah. the, what's the plan for Arista? So, what kind of so, features or tools do you want to include? So, in, in, in general, um, I know SURF is, is looking to, to pick up a lot of responsibility uh, in terms of, of providing services for the, for the Dutch Earth conservation community, as Tyler also already mentioned. And uh, the Science Center is, is continuously running more and more projects in this vein as well. Um, so we're basically we're building expertise and, and tooling to, to do the things that we need to do with these projects. Um, what we're at the same time trying to do is to prevent the situation where you have, let's say, an, an entire, entire walk-in situation. So uh, a freely adaptable open software solution as far as, as possible. What we've handled now is the, the basics of getting data, making data accessible um, to, your, to your local processes, uh, scaling up your computation with, with your accustomed um, environments. Uh, but what we'll definitely be doing based on the input we're trying to gather here, as well as what we've seen in, the, in, in other projects, is to write a, a grant application for continuation of this. So this, this came from a, a joint idea of members of SURF and eScience to put this to our, our respective uh, boards and get funding to, to try something like this out. Uh, depending on what what the resonance is, it's a success or not. Um, but then there is definitely, let's say, uh, machine learning that, that you want to pick up. And now machine learning is, in and of itself is something that needs to be tailored to the problem at hand. But what we've seen in one of the, the projects in iShell, for example, is that you're, you want to do things like automatic uh, object or damage detection. We're looking for features on, on remote sensing data. But uh, remote sensing data comes in large tiles, and you need to do, if you want to do unsupervised learning on it because you don't have the labeled data, you need to do things like variational autoencoders. That means that you need to make lots of little little chunks, little images from your from your main image that you can then use to train. Now, that entire batching step um, is something that that is not well sorted, and that we've done a prototype for. Um, and that, that was for, let's say, one satellite provider. So you have a, a rolling batcher that allows you to do, uh, to define multiple epochs over one large tile and then level it up for your data and, and get valid training sets that way without having to pollute your drive with umpteen bazillion small thumbnails. Um, so that type, of, that type of capability at the same time, we have multiple observation apps that's on it that, that have potential overlap in their fields of view. So you can also do a co-registration step on the data so that you can actually use multi-channel um, inputs to, to models. So the, what, what we're thinking about is to try to provide the kind of tooling to do that, to combine imagery from different satellites and to, to, defy, to make a, an easy batching process for, for that to then connect it to existing frameworks. So that's something that, that we would be interested in, in looking at for the future. Um, uh, there's definitely the, the capability that, that Martin was, was also talking about. Um, I mean, I know that, that, that they're doing it now, but the connection of, a, of an accessible server with the processing power of, of Spider or Celius behind it is something that, that would also be, be worth looking at. Um, and apart from that, we, we are demand driven um, in the sense that, I mean, my background is astrophysics. I, I know what I'd like to do with astrophysics for this, but I need people from Earth Observation to tell me, like, okay, this is fun, but how about this? Um, yeah. In that case, what you do support will not be like the infrastructure support, but project support, which is not different from, from other things. Right? So, from that, you could do actually maybe. And better to limit the expectations. Uh, something that is limited to Arista. And my understanding, is correct me if I'm wrong, when we talk about Arista, we are talking about providing the infrastructure, setting up the infrastructure that can be easily used, right? Yeah. So maybe, maybe the, what you ask to us uh, is what kind of needs do we have in terms of accessing the infrastructure, right? Yes. So uh, maybe it can be, it can facilitate this. 
and one observation that I have here also. Um, there are many things that we provide, and to be honest, I think most of the tools are generic tools, not something specific to Earth observations. So, creating a task cluster can be used for many purposes. Right? So, from that point of view, maybe it can be better to expand also this, better to package this uh, as something that is focusing on Earth observations, but in fact, focusing on providing a scientific infrastructure somehow. And maybe some of the tools like this, the stack foundation, I think it's really nice. And this is something really specific to the observation. So maybe it's better to keep as such. Yeah. yeah, no, you're 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 right. You're right. I mean basically launching launching a DAS cluster on, on hardware is is application agnostic. Um but conceptually in the way that that DAS works, I mean let's say um Someone wanting to run a very heavy numerical simulation is not that well served with DASC. In the sense that um, DASC, DASC is, is better at doing lots of comparable processes in, in parallel. Um, There's another assumption on the execution cases because it's really the current on the question that you have. Yes, yes, but, but my, my, my statement, okay. My statement isn't that um, all that Earth observation does not have heavy simulations and other domains only have heavy simulations. I know that Earth observation has lots of processing use cases, and we what we've built is not something that I that we only want to target at Earth observation. Absolutely not. I mean, but as as you correctly said, the the integration with the spatial temple asset catalog um, that that aspect of it is kind of focused on this, um, which, which is why we set up this demo for this community to do that. Um, I think that we will definitely also try to pitch and, and raise awareness for the tooling that's being developed in other communities for the aspect, for the things that are more generic than, than, than this specifically. Right? Oh, I, 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 I think I understand your point. And I think it's well taken, and I sincerely appreciate it. I think that we just need to distinguish the conflation between um, the, what, what this demo was aimed at and, and what the other potential uses of what has been constructed might, might be. I mean, I know that we're talking, we were talking with Raymond about C-scale, and okay, but that, that's, that's more of observation again. We have used DASC in, in astrophysics um, applications as well, so that, that's uh, definitely something that, that's worth picking up there as well. Um, but in terms of being able to continue work on it, as I said, we're, we're kind of, yeah, we're, we're project driven. We don't have a blue sky development budget, so um, we can either try to, to, to define a proposal to do something truly generic, but generic often becomes meaningless if you don't have a have some kind of a focus for it, and that's that's why this one was kind of focused on on Earth observation, remote sensing, with everything that's made. If it's applicable to other things, so much the better. But we kind of want to try to serve this this broad community, um, and in that sense, uh, your point on focusing on on generic tooling for the community is, is, was also valid. What what we would love is if you say, okay, I have maybe something between like generic infrastructure requirements, but also for my project. The way we came down with our requirements here was we looked at a bunch of different projects, that, and each and each of those projects specifically, we had to ask the question, okay, what does this project need? How can we serve the project need? But if you can then take a step back in, a, in something like ours dot and do a, a synthesis step where you look at, okay, what are the commonalities? Then from that you can have demand-driven generic products emerging. At least that's, that's what we're trying for, and that's why we're trying to solicit input. I mean, if you say, ah, th this is a generic infrastructure I'd love to have, so much the better. But if you say, this is my project, and this is what I'm running into, okay, then we'll, we're happy to listen to that, and we'll make notes of it, and then the next person says something else, and then we try to kind of come to a view of what we don't have here, and what people have been telling us, and what, let's say, comes up 30% of the time instead of only 1% of the time. And then we can try to focus to focus on that. I 
it, it's it's work in progress, and I mean, I'd love to discuss your thoughts further with that. Please, let's start. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm yeah. loud. The outside is also free right now, so feel free to take your side as well. But yeah, let's let's continue with discussing this, and I think I'd love to take your input. Thank you. 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 Thank you.